Good morning, everyone. My name is Baxter Shahid and I'm from the Office of Scientific Professional Development, Office of Chief Scientist at the FDA. And I'm pleased to welcome you to the second day of 2023 FDA Science Forum, Advancing Regulatory Science Through Innovations. Members of a cross-agency science forum working group have volunteered countless hours over the past year to organize this event. Thus, I would like to take a minute to give a special thanks to the Science Forum Planning Committee and various work groups, all our presenters, the FDA studio staff, web team and SharePoint team, and the AV team for all their assistance with the virtual platform. Today, we'll have four concurrent sessions that present the amazing diversity of scientific research at the FDA. Please refer to the agenda on the Science Forum's website for more information regarding your preferred sessions. The 2023 FDA Science Forum virtual poster sessions are also exhibited on FDA Science Forum website. The posters are available for download to all FDA Science Forum participants. In addition, the audience will have the opportunity to email their questions directly to the designated poster authors from June 13 through July 13, 2023. Lastly, you receive a survey to evaluate the FDA Science Forum in the next day or two. Please take a few minutes to complete the survey as we value your feedback to improve future FDA Science Forum. We thank you for joining us today. Session five will begin at 9 a.m. Again, please refer to the agenda on the Science Forum's website for more information regarding your preferred sessions. And now I'll hand over the virtual mic to the first moderator of session five. Thank you. Uh, good morning, and welcome to FDA Science Forum Session 6. My name is uh, Mogimene Manjanata. I am from the National Center for Toxicological Research. I am moderating this session, Session 6, with uh, Jenna Osborne from CDRH and uh, Monica Eng from CBER. As you are aware, this session discusses FDA's intramural and extramural regulatory science research to support medical countermeasures and emerging technologies to reduce or eliminate pathogens from medical products. The presentations will highlight the application of innovative tools and approaches to support pandemic response development and the evaluation of medical countermeasures and detection of emerging agents. I'm extremely happy to inform you that we have gathered an excellent group of speakers for this session, the first two speakers from outside of FDA and the other four speakers that follow them are within the FDA selected from different product centers based on their work in these areas that are highlighted. The external speakers have 20 minutes each to present, and the FDA internal speakers get 15 minutes each to present. All the speakers, please stay back until the end, as we have a 15-minute Q&A panel discussion where speakers can answer or address our questions or comments. Attendees, please type your questions or comments for the speakers into Q&A box, and I will make sure that I go over as many questions as possible. So in the interest of time, I'll not be able to go over each speaker's accomplishments, which is unfair, but please feel free to check out their bio on FDA site for more information on their work and their accomplishments. Without further ado, I would like to start by calling our first speaker, Dr. Sandeep Patel from Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, 
or also uh, known as BARDA. He's talking to us about uh, how to invest in the future of health security. Dr. Pat Patel, it's all levers. Sorry, was I on mute before? Can you guys hear me? Okay. Yeah, now we can hear you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Sandeep Patel. I'm the director of BARDA's Division of Research, Innovation, or Ventures, or DRIVE. Um, so what I want to talk to you about is a little bit about who we are, what we do, um, the kinds of um, uh, technologies that we're investing in, how we're envisioning they might impact pandemic preparedness and response. Um, and um, yeah, just a little bit about kind of, you know, how we're sort of uh, envisioning this this going forward. Um, so the, the, my, my job mostly, um, and I'll, I'll go introduce Barda a little bit later, but just wanted to kind of set the scene a little bit, but my my job mostly is to is to invest in in high risk high reward uh, technologies um, products capabilities um, the people that are driving those um, that we think are, will play substantial roles in in being able to prepare for respond to future public health emergencies broadly and this can include pandemics emerging infectious diseases um, and uh, also uh, chem bio rad nuke. Uh, health security threats as well. And, you know, if, if we're going to be successful in, in doing this, I think there's a few challenges that we face overall that we're, we're trying to address in various ways. So one is the fact that um, we're essentially trying to prepare for the unknown, right? We, we don't, we know there will be an emergency in the future. We know there's going to be a pandemic like event or other types of events. We don't know when, we don't know how, we don't know the specific nature of them. Um, you know, we can we can guess, but but essentially we're we're trying to develop technologies that we think will um, be useful in, in in a variety of scenarios, and that's a challenge, right? Um, just given scarcity of time and resources, um, and there's ways that we're sort of thinking about uh, how we'll address that. That I'll, I'll get back to. The other one is um, what I would call proof and scale, right? There's a lot of really um, emerging science technology out there, especially in adjacent fields. So things like artificial intelligence, material science, even behavioral sciences and things like that, that are presenting new opportunities for um, uh, um, uh, developing products and technologies that, that, that could kind of scale up. But but there's lots of challenges. There's big valley, uh, valley of death in terms of you know what 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 is promising, but to 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 test it, to validate it, to actually position it to to scale is is extremely difficult, and and how to do that is 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 hard, especially in um, when we're talking about working with startups and and other companies that are facing kind of um, uh, pressures to succeed early. Um, the third uh, I would call commercial viability. So you know I think in many ways Barda. Um, and drive and what we're supporting is is uh, products that don't necessarily have commercial uh, markets by themselves, but there are also many types of things that we support in which we, you know, are looking for kind of what we call dual use, um, uh, where there is a commercial use case for it, but there's also a kind of an emergency um, response use for it. And, and I think those are ideal scenarios and, and trying to navigate and trying to create sustainability along those lines is, is also challenging. The fourth is is what we call usability. I think this is one of my pet peeves in medical product development in general, is that I think in general, we have this tendency to kind of sit in the corner and, and spend uh, years and, and, and lots of money developing products. And at the very end, we kind of throw it at people and, and you know, ask them you know, to use it. Um, and so trying to think about usability, clinical utility, all of these things kind of upfront in the design of products is something that's really important. So, so anyway, these are some of the challenges that we're, we're kind of facing. Um, um, just to step back a little bit, just to explain BARDA. So BARDA, if you're, if you're not familiar, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, we're a 17-year-old organization within HHS, with, uh, within the Administration for Strategic Preparedness and Response, or ASPR. Um, and our goal pretty much is to work with industry um, and other partners to develop medical countermeasures. So things like vaccines, therapeutics, diagnostics, other, other technologies that, again, will be useful in emergency responses. 
um, we have lots of uh, ways of working with industry, large and small. Um, in fact, you can see the list of all the groups that we've worked with over the last 17 years. The, the sort of take home point here is that there's a wide range here between large pharma biotech companies to uh, um, small academic labs to nonprofit um, organizations and you know everything in between. Um, and with our partners, over the last, uh, this is actually uh, uh, dated a little bit, but over the last uh, 17 years, we've gotten 75 or so products um, licensed, approved uh, by the FDA. Um, so pandemic influenza vaccines, um, COVID-19 vaccines, uh, flu tests, um, uh, home molecular tests, and a variety of other kinds of products as well. Um, but as we look into the future, as I sort of alluded to, I think one of the challenges that we're facing and also an opportunity is that when we think about emergency response, right, you can sort of think about this in a, in a kind of a spectrum of response, everything from early warning systems to detection, um, products that could protect populations and in emergencies to, you know, developing medical countermeasures, producing them, distributing them, and, and ensuring that they're kind of administered in the, in the right way at the right time. Um, there's lots of opportunities for for innovation here, and this is sort of a, a, a notional, but but gives you kind of a sense of kind of the opportunity space that that we're looking at and are interested in. Um, and it also presents challenges in terms of you know how to how to validate, scale, um, deploy, sustain these kinds of um, uh, capabilities. Um, what we're doing in Drive, um, and so we've chosen kind of a, over the last few years, a, a specific set of problems to, to kind of tackle in this sort of R&D space. And here's kind of a list of our, our programs. Um, the, the theme behind this, and I'll, I'll go over a couple of these um, kind of briefly, but, but the theme sort of behind all of this is, um, one is that, and, and going back to this issue of preparing for the unknown, you know, the, a lot of these are, are programs where we're trying to develop products that we think will be useful no matter the, the specific situation. So, um, you know, threat agnostic, uh, disease agnostic, or kind of preparing for threat X type of things. There's different ways to kind of uh, characterize that, but um, they're, they're kind of broad uh, capabilities that, that again, I think are going to substantially improve um, our response capabilities. But also, you know, most of these have some kind of commercial viability as well, and so we're trying to think about how to how to um, thread that that line a little bit. Um, I'll give you a few examples uh, um, of this. So one is um, we have this program uh, for the last few years called Beyond the Needle. Um, so the goal of this program really is to develop um, uh, alternatives to syringes and needles for for delivery of vaccines. Um, and so we've had a number of, of partnerships with uh, mostly um, startup companies in this space, uh, mostly product developers that are working on things like microneedle uh, uh, array patches for vaccine delivery, um, maybe intranasal oral formulations and things like that. Um, the, the reason we're interested in this is that from an emergency response scenario, um, it is useful to have um, uh, modes of administration for vaccines where uh, it requires fewer healthcare workers to administer. The logistics of, of, of storage and distribution are, are, are simplified. Um, and we can potentially enable things like self-administration or other modes that might make it easier to you know, mass vaccinate a population or um, to reach hard to reach uh, populations, you know, either rural or underserved or um, um, you know, uh, um, others as well. And, and our, most of our work thus far has been, you know, to try to both validate the, or, or sort of test the, the devices in a variety of, um, kind of vaccine formats, um, do some preclinical work on like immunogenicity, um, on some of the manufacturing work as well. And, and we're kind of continuing to advance this. Our goal here is to kind of eventually commercialize, um, this platform so that we could have an alternative to syringes and needles and delivery. Um, another example of a program that we're focusing on is what we call vaccines on demand. This was recently launched. Um, we actually have partners that aren't listed here, but um, well, the, the goal here, right, is that we want to develop um, capabilities that might allow for small footprint on demand, um, um, uh, low resource requirement um, vaccine production. Um, so this can include nucleic acids or viral vector type vaccines, protein-based vaccines, or others as well. 
Um, part of the reason for this, again, is to is to enable you know small dose production for rapid response as, as necessary. Um, to provide some decentralization, so so we're reducing kind of vulnerabilities in supply chains and things like that. Um, but also, you know, to sort of improve business cases for for production and storage of vaccines um, in the future. So uh, more to come on that. Um, another example uh, is a program we called Host Directed Therapeutics. So what's what's interesting about this one is where, you know, I, th I think while while most of our efforts in terms of medical countermeasure development for pandemics is focused on on uh, at least the treatment side is focused on specific kind of antiviral activity, um, whether it's a small molecule or, or uh, kind of uh, monoclonal antibody based therapies. Um, they're designed for specific um, pathogens and threats and you know, one thing that we recognize is that there are common consequences of, of infection, um, uh, dysregulation of immune systems, uh, multi-organ kind of dysfunctions that, that follow multiple scenarios. And so, again, going back to the how to prepare for multiple threats, um, one of our strategies is, is to develop therapies for things like sepsis and acute respiratory distress syndrome and other um um, conditions that that are that are common but but um, but consequential for for disease severity um, and that those therapies are going to be useful in multiple situations and so we we've had a number of um, uh, investments um, uh, with a bunch of partners in this space and there's a wide what I want to point out here too is there's a wide variety of modalities so these aren't just Kind of pharmaceutical based uh, interventions they're they're device based interventions there there's other types of uh, work as well um, another program uh, uh, we we'll call host based diagnostics and so here what we're really interested in is um, both from a pre infection pre exposure state to post acute infectious state to kind of post acute infectious state to uh, have better systems to measure, you know, uh, patients' uh, host responses to to those um, to those infections, um, to understand kind of a patient's vulnerability, to understand um, severity for predictive power in terms of future decompensation and stuff like that. Again, these we we sort of view these as extremely powerful, um, non-invasive tools in many cases that that might allow us to identify those who are going to be really sick or versus those who might not be very sick and to, and to kind of distribute care as, as appropriate in emergency scenarios for, for those situations. So having better understandings of kind of host, host response, host um, state is really important. So we, we've been making a number of investments in this space, including a, a recent FDA approval for a, a sepsis test um, from one of our partners. Um, the, the last example I wanted to share um, is a program called ANAC, and this is a, a little bit similar or plays off a little bit with the last program, but this is a, a program that was one of the original drive programs in which we're specifically trying to develop kind of physiological signatures um, that might allow us to identify uh, pre-symptomatic or early symptomatic or even potentially asymptomatic uh, uh, infection um, or signs of infection. Um, our, our sort of you know, there's sort of a few motivations for this. One is that, you know, especially when, when we have antivirals that need, um, need to be administered in a certain time interval after signs of infection show up um, to situations where we might want to find ways to reduce community transmission um, more effectively. Um, these are potentially powerful tools to, to signal and give, you know, people an extra day or two to, to, to in advance of a notification of possible infection to maybe potentially trigger a conformatory test or, or potential treatment in the future, or to signal to someone that, you know, the, um, opportunities to, to reduce community transmission of, of various infections. So, so we, we've been making tons of investments in the space and trying to advance the, the field there as well. Um, what I wanted to hit on real quick on, on all of this is that um, I think by the nature of what we do, right, we're trying to invest in these sort of emerging technologies and capabilities. You know, I think they both present opportunities for, for new capabilities to be fielded, but also present a number of challenges in terms of, especially on the, the, the regulatory side, on the validation side and things like that. Um, and just to kind of hit sort of at a high level, some of these, right, on the vaccines on demand, we have the situation where um, you know, we, we, uh, are trying to propose these small footprint, you know, field forward kind of manufacturing sites. Right. And so presenting challenges in terms of 
quality control validation of, of these of these systems um, it presents a challenge and, and we're working on a lot of this. Um, in terms of the beyond the needle program, right? This is a new type of device that we're supporting. It's eventually going, you know, be viewed as a combo device potentially. Um, but but the validation of both the vaccine, but it's the mode of delivery, you know, presents challenges in terms of um, regulatory navigation. Um, the idea of self administration again is also a new concept here um, that that will uh, present uh, additional challenges and opportunities for for development of evidence on the host therapeutic side. You know, one of the issues here is that we're 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 positioning these as as essentially pathogen agnostic indications, right? And so, you know, developing endpoints on on some of these is is challenging to trying to think about how to how to position these for use in multiple disease states, multiple infectious states. Again, presents some challenges on the on the regulatory side. Um, the one of the ways we're viewing this too is that um, that depending on someone's immune type, we might think about various tailored therapies for that specific immune type rather than trying to think about a population at large. And so the need for companion diagnostics, um, complementary diagnostics that go along with this um, is going to be key. And again, we'll, we'll sort of provide additional challenges in terms of how to, how to identify patients and things like that. Um, on the host DX and NX side, I think there's uh, a lot of the, the work that we're supporting, you know, is powered by artificial intelligence, machine learning, um, this is a space that's rapidly evolving, and so so presents again opportunities and challenges here. Um, a little bit of a tension here between two of, of a software as a medical device in some cases versus clinical decision support tools, and you know we're sort of supporting both of these, but but then certainly presents some challenges as well. Um, and then you know these are essentially new categories of of devices and tools, I think, and so trying to think about sort of, you know, what pathways uh, these devices take, um, you know, it can go in multiple ways and it's just another sort of layer of uncertainty. Um, one of the ways we're addressing this, um, just going back to um, the, some of this, that work that we do. So we have our R and D programs, but we also have a separate sort of function within drive where we're trying to develop uh, new types of partnerships with various entities that, you know, we sort of call ecosystem uh, partnerships where we're trying to create spaces in which companies, researchers, others can, can both um, uh, navigate um, in, in sort of a safe environment, do some validation testing, uh, 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 have access to a variety of experts, whether it's investment experts or regulatory experts or commercial experts or, or others, um, as well as sort of peer-to-peer -peer interactions that might kind of improve um, learning at the early stage that, that's really, really important for some of these small companies. So, um, you know, I'll sort of hit these really quickly, but but um, uh, actually, yeah, I'll, I'll go through these really quickly. So one of our partnerships, we started a couple of years ago um, called Barta Ventures, is a partnership with the Global Health Investment Corporation. So here we're actually doing something very different um, where we're actually invest doing venture capital investing in companies. And so instead of doing kind of non-dilutive R&D contract-based funding, um, we don't do grants, but we do contract-based funding typically. Um, we're, we're using um, tools that the venture capital investment community do. So equity-based investments in which, you know, investments are made and there's sort of equity in a company that's exchanged for that. Um, our partner does this on our behalf um, and has invested in a number of companies that are in BARDA's mission space. And one of the interesting advantages here is that this allows, um, this provides another way that we can support these companies and provide strategic um, uh, guidance um, for, for a lot of these companies who are navigating, you know, multiple spaces and, and the infectious disease space that we're interested in, you know, maybe more of an unknown for them. And so, so it, it allows us an opportunity to work more directly with these companies. Um, another partnership we have uh, that, that, that's pretty exciting is, is one with, um, with Johnson & Johnson. So, um, um, Pharma company that uh, they have these um, what's called oh sorry I'm on the accelerator network um, so another partnership we have uh, is a program we have is called the Bard Accelerator Network so we partnered with 13 um, incubators accelerators around the around the country um, where we provide wraparound support for companies um, uh, networking outreach both to Barda but also to investment partners commercialization support all this kind of stuff. Um, so this is this has been really fantastic because it gives us an opportunity to see companies early, to talk to them, to give them some guidance, support, see them before you know we would potentially partner with them more directly, and it's kind of created this nurturing uh, ecosystem space 
Um, regulatory issues are also something that, that, that are sort of talked about and discussed in this space. Um, so this is the J&J example. Um, we have a partnership with Johnson Johnson. They have these um, what's called JLab sites. These are life science incubators across the US, including one in Washington, DC, um, um, North America and, and Europe as well, um, in which we su support 35 plus companies in this what we call Blue Knight partnership. Um, so these are all companies that are kind of in Barnett's mission space. Um, usually early stage companies um, uh, that are looking for support of various kinds and mentorship. And so all of these companies get mentorship from BARDA and from Johnson & Johnson. So um, this is a really great partnership for us because we get to see a lot of these exciting companies. Um, and for them, they get access to the, to the mentors and again, have a space where they can kind of grow and nurture um, as well. Um, I'm going to stop there. Uh, hopefully that gives you a sense of kind of the, the range of things we're working on. Check out our website at drive.hs.gov if you want to learn more about Drive, if you want to learn more about BARDA overall, which I didn't spend a ton of time talking about, um, uh, you can go to medicalcountermeasures.gov uh, as well. So thank you very much. I will stop here. Thank you, uh, Dr. Patel. That was very insightful and you sort of convinced us that uh, investing in the future of health security is important. Uh, you finished five minutes early. Thank you for that. But uh, I guess uh, for questions, we have decided uh, to go at the end. And I hope attendees, you know, type in the question in the Q&A box. All right. Uh, with that, I'm going to call the second speaker. And uh, my apologies if I mispronounce his name, uh, Dr. Wahan uh, Semenian. Yes, Simonian, thank you. Uh, Simonian, sorry about that. Um, and Dr. S uh, Wahan is from Emblema and George Washington University. And the title of his talk is FDA Argos, where trusted sequence data meets quality by design approach. Dr. Wahan, take, Thank take you it so much. Uh, let me share my screen, and uh, I would be happy if you confirm seeing the screen. Yes, we can, and we hear you as well. Thank you. So Dr. Wahan Simonian here, uh, Chief Scientist of Emblema, formerly Lead Scientist at the FDA. Today, I'm going to tell you about uh, Argos uh, database and uh, describe why this database has a very critical importance in an industry, and then uh, describe what has been done before us and what we are doing now and where this is going. Okay. Um, so so the, how, how do we usually um, detect uh, infectious agents in a human being or in an environment? There are two fundamentally different types of methodologies. In one of them, we already have a preliminary knowledge. So we design small panels or well, uh, for well-characterized, well-known sequences. And we use these panels in a diagnostic settings to detect sample of number of pan, uh, bacteria or viruses or other infectious agents. And then there is an agnostic approach to this problem. We the NGS sequence the samples, biological samples, which are coming from humans and the environment, and we agnostically try to assemble every single species which is inside of that biological sample. And then uh, without even prior knowledge, we can devise what bacteria and what viruses and what other pathogens are there. This is a hypothesis-free approach when we don't need to have a preliminary understanding of what are the species we are looking for in order to detect those. So uh, and how do we actually detect in an NGS approach? Once imagine we already have taken all of these sequences, assembled back them references, which is called reference sequences. This is a sequence which best characterizes a nucleotide sequence in that species chromosomes. And then what we do, we do NGS experiment for individual patients on the left, and then we take these individual sequences and we take these reference sets of known pathogens. And then one by one, we align every sequence in a read space to the reference sequence on the right side of it. And by doing so, we know this piece of a nucleic sequence piece, which is in our NGS experiment, has came from this particular bacteria from this location. It might, we also do usually annotate. We know, for example, this is a sequence of a particular gene of known bacteria or whatever it is. Yeah, so now, yeah, but this is the process by uh, sequencing humans, doing NGS sequencing, and then mapping them to reference sequences and detecting which part of that reference species sequence does it represent. 
But the problem is very problem is to make a good quality reference sequences. Why? And this is the problem. Now imagine when I'm just making the reference sequence, I don't still have any. I have all I have is a bunch of short reads already from that mix of short reads which I've taken from a patient. So the way it works, I start looking, I mean, algorithms which are called assemblies, they start looking for similarities, partial or complete similarity of all of this mess and trying to see which one may potentially be the continuation of the other one. Imagine taking a library of a Congress, threading it through the shredder, so the longest piece is only 100 bytes long, and then giving it to me and saying, Vahan, now you have to get it back together. Of course, I'm going to see and look if there are similar pieces which glue well together. So that's the process, which is very similar for reference genome assembly. So by doing so, we find which pieces go after which ones, which ones overlap, which ones don't. And this is an error, very error prone, because there's a lot of similarities between the pieces. A single piece may be attached to multiple different pieces. Imagine in a Library Congress example, if you see the word which is matching part of this sentence or that sentence, but that word can be in 10 other sentences. So instead of creating one linearly beautiful map, we usually create what are called scaffolds, possibilities of the text being this or that. And so from those scaffolds, we have to actually then devise the reference sequence. So this process, as you may imagine, is very error prone. Yes, why? Because sequences have similarities. Let's say two reference sequences here are presented on top may have uh, the yellowish pieces similar to each other, but every other piece is different from each other. So imagine if I'm trying to assemble this, these blue pieces may be glued to yellow pieces in any different order, and then you wouldn't know which one is real or which one is not. And uh, especially this situation is also very bad when uh, uh, usual sequences are from different isolates. So it may be the same single species may already represent a pro problem because there are yellow pieces which are self-similar to each other. But they also, if you have a mixture of different isolates, which are also self-similar, now the situation is dramatically even more worse. And then clonality appears. Even if I get a single, uh, a single uh, species, usually in, an, in a real life, that single species is not represented with a single sequence. There is a clonality, there are strains forming, and so on and so forth. And that already is bound to have self-similarities to each other. And that creates additional problems. So in general, all of these uh, result to the fact that different tools assemble from same original sequences, assemble separate different reference sequences. And that is a problem because then we take those reference sequences and rely on them to actually do our diagnostics because these fuzzy little tarballs of um, um, which are uh, sophisticatedly made and not really reliable are then used for diagnostics measures. And that's a trouble. So the task of the FDA Argos is actually how we can quality control an error prone process. And one of the approaches that we are offering here and we are, we are actually we have implemented here, we take the original reads from which those have been assembled and we align them back to the references where it has been assembled to. So obviously, in an ideal scenario, if I have a single sequence and I align my reads to the reference sequence which, uh, from, to which I have assembled, there should not be mutations detected. This alignment should perfectly lie on a reference and things. The reality, however, tells us different story. So we do, I, uh, like imagine if the sequences from this pool on the read pool come to the reference and then we see little stars which are mutations, insertions and deletions. Obviously, assuming like we are still dealing, never dealing with a clean, clean, real clean sample, we expect some number of mutations to creep in, and then we see them here and there. But we are not supposed to see, let's say, 100% mutation, because if it was a 100% mutation there, why didn't that letter already be a reference consensus letter? Yes. So, for example, we have different coverage disbalances. Some parts of the sequences are covered much higher than others. We sometimes see the gaps in a, a scaffold, that there is a piece in a reference which is not being even aligned by reads. How would you even make this reference if none of the reads was representing this piece of a sequence? Believe it or not, these are real situations. So, I mean, I'm, I'm going to show you two examples, real life situations, which have been uh, downloaded from a uh, uh, RefSec and CBI. So uh, the top diagram, what you see the uh, X axis in all of these diagrams is the uh, long length of the sequence reference itself. 
So in this case, about 900 sequence. This is showing the coverage. How many reads have been covering this position on this reference? So you can see coverage already has some inequality, but it's all over very high quality, uh, high, high coverage sequence. The, the, there's no disbalance on the left or right, not much disbalance. Overall qualities presented in red are here, very good. And then we can see there are some mutations, which is a diagram second from the bottom. There are some mutations, but if you can see, these are one or 2% mutations detected all over the place, and that's normal. We have like, let's say, 1,000 coverage, but 20 of the sequences had mutation in a certain position. Is this possible? This, this is not a danger sign. And in an indel diagram, which is in the bottom, we don't see any mutations or indels at all. Now, let's see another refer reference sequence sample, which is downloaded from reputable source. We can see the coverage diagram has big gaps, that there are pieces which aren't even covered, and there are only spikes here and there. We can see there is a huge disbalance when sequences go one way, but not the other way. Entropy is completely messed up. Entropy is like how random the, the sequence letters appear on read frame. The quality diagram has these downfalls. And then there are number, almost 100, 100% mutations. I mean, above 50% uh, above mutations. And this is a clearly dangerous situation. You're not supposed to have this in an assembly. These sequences should not be relied upon. But when I went and looked, how many people are using this sequence as a reference materials for their publications in the future, there is more than 50 publications to this particular reference. So it is very important for us to detect that these situations have to be addressed and quality metrics have to be given. So originally, FDA Argos, so this was the challenge part, yes? So originally, FDA Argos was pursuing this goal to ensure that we have a, a lot of good quality sequences assembled, which we, call, we like to call regulatory grade, where it's not maybe even as important to have no problems in a sequence as it is important to know where these problems are. Sometimes it's impossible mathematically to resolve all of the problems in sequence assembly. Our task is not to make them perfect. Our task is to detect where quality issues are, and then if possible, make them better. So in 2014, FDA and collaborators already started the Argos projects. We were not really deeply involved at that point, and there are multiple participants who actually started this. They got almost 2,000 microbes in the sequence database, started doing all different types of quality controls on these sequences. And then there is a, okay, let me skip some of them. Okay, so at, at, at this point, there's actually about 4,500 sequences assembled in, in Argos, even before us. There are genomic DNAs, genomic RNAs. This is kind of a statistics to where we were, about 1,600 uh, samples, biosamples have been assembled, uh, uh, biosamples have been collected, and 1,400 assemblies have been made at this point into FDA Argos. But the source for the sequence was somewhat uh, following this path, which says isolate to genome. So they were isolates accumulated from all over the places, and then um, sequenced using PacBio and the short read sequencing, and then assembled and then deposited into Argos database. This is what we call isolate to genome pathway. But, um, you know, but for God's sake, why would you even not use other sequences in a universe, in a world, which a lot of different scientists are accumulating, a lot of different scientists are sequencing. So we decided to expand Argos by taking the sequences from outside, pandemic data sets, COVID, Ebola, you name it, more than 20 different other species from all around the world that have been assembled, uh, have been sequenced, have been assembled. So we uh, created this additional pathway called genome to isolate. So genome to isolate pathway uh, allows us to expand much broader perspective without spending extra arm and the length of sequencing again every time we find a new species. So, and then we also absorb sequences from existing genome repositories and putting it back to Argos. Okay, so this is the pathways as uh, they were. Yes, so first, the sequences would come from this variety of sources, go to isolate, sample metadata will be cataloged, nucleic acids would be extracted, uh, short read assemblies, long read assemblies, some read QC uh, has been done, and then bacterial assemblies are about uh, assembly QC is now what we are also doing, and then depositing it into Argos database, and also we already can deposit back to National Center for Biotechnology information where these sequences are available. So Argos database 
actually we we um, we create the sequences, we uh, assemble them, we quality control them, but we put them back to an NCBI who has a responsibility of keeping bio project um, bio bio projects and FDA Argos is a bio project and all associated sequences are kept inside of NCBI. So we assemble. Um, so in addition to all of the uh, Argos first original version of the Argos sequencing quality controls. We started doing very thorough quality controls on NGS values. We characterized not just the reference itself, but also the sequence, read, short read sequences from which they are coming. And we do, of course, assemblies themselves. We have, uh, and then we also give a lot of um, uh, comprehensive evaluation. And, and so, for example, we benchmark reference uh, guided genomic data standards. We, we do to evaluate different sequences versus each other. We assign quality control metrics. So, and sometimes it's very important to recognize that the sequence which has the highest quality score is not necessarily the one that you want for a particular task. And, and it sounds surprising, but let's say I'm detecting a, uh, I'm designing a PCR probe, and, and then PCR probe is lying on a location of a sequence which might have locally uh, very high quality, but overall sequence quality for that reference might not be as high, but the locations where I'm going to hook my PCR probes are high. So in that case, I would preferably choose the one which has the higher quality score sequence for the task which I am choosing, yes? So these are very important. So we are not qualifying or disqualifying the sequences. We are just characterizing them and we are scoring them for different tasks. For example, we already have internally uh, the quality scores for uh, the, the PCR probe design or quality score for overall metagenomic sequencing design, et cetera. So all of these sequences that we do have, again, it's very important. We are not disqualifying or qualifying. We are annotating and quality attributes of the sequences. And there are a variety of number of uses that um, this can be used in. So overall, I mean, what we really generate is a bunch of files, JSON files, which are downloadable by API, or, or also we have a visual interfaces which will allow you to look into these. These are all characteristics so you can you can either come to the website of Argos and start looking at where the quality issues are, et cetera, in diagrams like the one I showed before, or you can, if you are a software developer and you are designing, say, let's say, some something based on that reference sequence, you can immediately download all of this information uh, through programmatic access interface and do whatever you want to do with that sequences. Because at this age and time, it's very important to provide this information in all of the ways. So. Uh, what I'm, I'm going to adapt, so this is the visual interface for the search engine. So, so you come, you can say, select organism, uh, for example, you can select overall quality scores. There is an extensive search interface for this. So you can uh, select, uh, there's about 20 different metadata uh, accumulated for biosamples, about uh, 50 other attributes for NGS quality, about 20 attributes for uh, assembly quality. So all of these are in a search space. You can construct a very uh, complex search query to find the set of references which you are interested in, and then you can download them and use them for your purpose. So, and this is the statistics of what we have been enriching Argos with after in the second uh, life cycle of Argos. We have number of uh, sequences from Salmonella, from SARS-CoV-2, from Marburg. I'm not going to read all over the place. These are uh, some statistics of the sequences that we are actually getting through. And we, the hope is that we cover most of the important pathogens which are of relevance, but it's also very important for us can we build a system which is dynamic and responsible enough so if new issues, new sequences come out, we quickly can integrate those. Like, God forbid there's another pandemic situation happen or something, we will be able today very quickly assemble a large number of sequences and do quality control and put them inside of the database. So it's not just about the static, static picture of these sequences that we are building. We are actually building toolkits and visually web available tools for um, um, uh, uh, receiving new sequences in a very quickly fashion and integrating it to Argos. So the use cases that we envision 
uh, might be different, of course, once you have a lot of uh, nice, uh, nicely quality controlled sequences. So the idea is that diagnostic, um, uh, there might be diagnostic use cases where sequences are NGS sequence. And then uh, in Argos, we also build not just QC tools, but we also have built tools that allow you to identify, for example, your sequence based on Argos sequences. If you have a big repository of database and then you have NGS samples, it's your task to take it away from to, into your computer and analyze them. But we are also building tools on top of Argos database that you can come, you bring your sequences, you analyze it in place. Yes. Let's say you bring your NGS sequencing, you can immediately analyze and we will uh, give a panel agnostic panel of all of the bacteria, all of the viruses or parasites that are inside of Argus and in your sample. So we see this uh, use, although this has been originally used for um, um, influenza and COVID and pandemic viruses and bacteria, we also have kind of an engine allows you to do much broader type of use cases. For example, we see fitness for food safety monitoring, we see fitness for um, uh, all types of different situations. Yes, and it might be pandemic response, outbreak monitoring, clinical outcomes. We even see the case then we have a patient samples coming in and, and, and the sequences are immediately aligned and verified with against Argos reference data, quality control data sets and the reports are generated potentially for clinical outcome in the future. So this is the last diagram for me. Please, if you have any questions, feel free to kind of ask now or later when it's time. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wahan. That was an excellent presentation describing what FDA Argos does as well. And uh, uh, attendees, please type in your question in the Q&A so that we can discuss this at the end. Okay, with that, I'm gonna call the next speaker, uh, Dr. Marianne Major. She's from CBER. And she's going to talk to us on assessing the role of T cell responses in SARS CoV 2 protection. Dr. Major. Good morning. Thank you. I hope you can see my slides. Um, so, yes, I'm going to be talking today about um, looking at the role of T cell responses in SARS CoV 2 in protection, but then also particularly in enhanced pathology after infection. So this is a disclaimer. This is um, not representative of FDA policy. Um, so as by way of introduction, um, so as you all know, severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2, SARS-CoV-2, it's a causative agent of COVID-19, and it's claimed the lives of more than 6 million people worldwide. Um, all the currently U.S. licensed and approved vaccines against SARS-CoV-2 induce immune responses against the viral surface glycoprotein, which is known as the spike. But some exploratory vaccines that have been published in the literature and that we have actually seen within the FDA have included the nuclear capsid protein from SARS-CoV-2 in addition to the spike. So why are people looking at this as a potential um, antigen for inclusion in vaccines? Um, the nuclear capsid is immunogenic. It's not on the surface of the virus, but it is immunogenic and it's less variable than the spike. And the um, hypothesis is that this may provide broader protection against viral variants, but it would mainly be through the induction of T cell responses. But the downside of this is that previous studies with SARS-CoV-1 um, several years ago reported increased lung pathology in animal models when immune responses against the nuclear capsid were induced. And this is a concern for the FDA because we do not want to put vaccines into trials that might result in enhanced lung pathology after people actually become exposed to the virus following immunization. So what we decided to do was actually look at this ourselves and assess whether there is increased lung pathology um, in challenged mice after you immunize them with the nuclear capsid. And we looked at the nuclear capsid from SARS-CoV-2. So this would match the challenge virus that we used in these studies and also looked at the nuclear capsid from SARS-CoV-1, which is a slightly mismatched nuclear capsid protein sequence. And so the theory there was that this would probably be a suboptimal immune response relative to the um, challenge virus that we'd be using. So to perform these studies, um, we used, as I said, we used a mouse model. We used mice transgenic for the human ACE2 receptor. 
which is the receptor for SARS-CoV-2. And these mice were immunized with adenovirus vectors expressing the nuclear capsid protein from either SARS-CoV-1, which I've designated as ADN1 in these slides, or from SARS-CoV-2, which is referred to as ADN2. So mice were immunized and then challenged with wild type SARS-CoV-2 virus. We use the Washington strain. And then we looked at lung pathology and lung and brain RNA titers. So this shows the immune responses after we immunize the mice with the um, adenovirus vectors. And these are, are immune responses against the SARS-CoV-2 nuclear capsid. And as you can see here, this is antibody. This is an ELISA response. And so both the ADN1 group, so the group that were immunized with the nuclear capsid from SARS-CoV-1, the ADN1 group and the ADN2 group have very nice um, antibody responses. So the, the vectors were immunogenic. And they also had T cell responses assessed by um, interferon gamma ELI spot assay. Interestingly, the ADN1 group where the immunizing um, agent was not exactly matched to the peptides used in the early spot was actually higher than the ADN2. And this is actually something we saw quite consistent, but both groups had T cell responses. So what did we see when we, when we actually challenged these mice? Well, we actually saw a better survival in the two immunized groups and a lower body weight loss in the two immunized groups compared to the control group that just received um, adenovirus with no transgene expression. And um, we didn't expect to see a great deal of protection because this is a T-cell-based vaccine. It doesn't have neutralizing antibody to, to prevent the virus from entering cells. But what we were looking for here was to see whether we had increased mortality in the groups that were given the adenovirus expressing nucleocapsid or greater body weight loss. And so not only did we not see that, we saw a better outcome for these both, both of these immunized groups, which was encouraging. So then we looked at the RNA levels in the lungs and the brains. So here, on the left at the top is shown the, lung tit um, the virus titers in the lungs. And what we can again see in both of the immunized groups is that we see a reduction in virus titers in the lungs of both immunized groups compared to the control group, which indicates that there is some protection, even though it's only T cell with this group, um, with these immunized groups and with these vaccines. And when we looked at the brain, now this particular model, the virus in this model does go to the brain. So it's very difficult to protect the brain with just a T cell immune response. But what we can see even then in the N1 group, we still do see a reduced virus titer in the brain of these mice compared to the control group. But really the critical um, thing to be looking at is the lung pathology. And as you can see immediately here, that both the ADN1 and the ADN2 group had much less reduced lung pathology compared to the control group. So, and this is consistent with what we're seeing with the RNA levels. But again, what we're seeing here, um, we were looking to see if we actually saw higher scores in these two immunized groups compared to the control group, and we did not. So, this was really indicating to us that this particular vaccine platform does not result in enhanced pathology when you immunize um, mice and challenge them. But then the question is, what if you combine the nuclear capsid with the spike? Because no vaccine is going to consist of just nuclear capsid and the next generation vaccines are going to consist of capsid plus spike if that's, if that's something that anybody wants to develop. So again, we, we performed the same experiments um, with the transgenic mice expressing the human ACE2 receptor. And we had three groups. The, um, the mice were immunized with the ADN1, so the nuclear capsid from SARS-CoV-1. And we added adenovirus expressing SARS-CoV-2 spike, and that's designated as ADS in these slides. And then we also had the ADN2 group with the ADS. And then we also had ADS alone to see if um, combining the nuclear capsid with the spike was detrimental compared to spike alone. So again, the mice were challenged with wild type SARS-CoV-2. And we again looked at lung pathology and lung and brain RNA titers. So this slide shows the antibody responses. So these are the new immune responses prior to challenge in the mice. So we looked at binding antibody by ELISA. And as you can see here, these are anti-spike antibodies and each of the groups that included the ADS, so the adenovirus expressing spike, have nice levels of antibody to the spike. 
And then for anti-nuclear capsid, of course, we only see antibodies to the nuclear capsid in the ADN1 and ADN2 groups that included ADS, because for the ADS alone, that's the adenovector expressing just spike, there's no nuclear capsid antigen there. So we did not see any um, nuclear capsid antibodies, which is expected. And then the neutralizing antibody, which is actually the functional antibody that will prevent the virus from entering cells, we see nice levels of um, neutralizing antibody for each of the immunized groups, which all um, had the adeno expressing the spike protein included. And there was not really a difference between the three groups. So then we just looked at the T cells. And again, we looked at uh, spike peptide, um, use spike peptides and nuclear capsid peptides to look at the um, T cell response to both of those antigens. And so in the um, the two groups that had the uh, nuclear capsid and the spike in the vaccine, we saw nice levels of T cells to both the spike and the nuclear capsid. And of course, with the ADS, which only had the spike protein, again here, we only see responses to the spike peptides because there's no nuclear capsid as the antigen. And also looking at CD8 interferon gamma positive cells by fax, we also see the same picture, which is we see immune responses, CD8 T cells expressing interferon gamma in both of the groups that got the nuclear capsid and the spike against the spike and nuclear capsid pro, um, peptides. But we only really see a response to the spike in the ADS group um, because, again, there's no nuclear capsid. So, what do we see when we challenge these mice? Well, you can see immediately for survival, we saw 100% survival in each of the groups that um, were immunized, whether they had nuclear capsid plus spike or spike alone. And so again, what we were looking for here was to see, is there less survival in these two groups where the nuclear capsid was combined with spike compared to the ADS alone or even compared to the adenol group? And we do not. And then again, for body weight, we really saw no body weight loss. So the outcome was very similar for the groups that had nuclear capsid plus spike or spike alone. So then looking at the RNA titers, this shows on the left, we have the long RNA titers in each of these um, groups. So the black is again the adenal group. This is the control group. So first of all, when we look at the, the um, spike immunized animals, we could actually not detect any RNA in the lungs for those groups, for that group of mice at any time point after challenge. Um, in the ADN1 and ADS group, we do see a slightly higher um, level of, of lung um, RNA titers, but it's still much, much lower than the control group. And it's actually lower in the ad adenovirus expressing the nuclear capsid from SARS-CoV-2 with the SARS um, with the spike protein, much, much less than the um, control group. And in this case, what we found with the brain, again, if we look at the control group first, we saw much lower levels of RNA in the brain with the adeno spike alone. But again, we saw lower levels in the brain with both of the groups that had the combined vaccination. So including the ADN one or ADN2 with spike did not enhance um, infection and did not result in increased um, RNA replication in either the lungs or the brain. And then finally, the pathology, which again is what we were really focusing on to try and understand if with any possibility of enhanced pathology in these mice, we compare the, um, the ad null group with the Adeno expressing spike alone. You can see that there's very, very little lung pathology in that group. And I added back here to this slide the ADN1 and ADN2 alone. So you can see there's very, very low pathology. And in the combined groups, it's also very low pathology compared to the control group. So in all of these cases where we included the nuclear capsid, either from um, SARS-CoV-1 or from SARS-CoV-2, and either alone, which is in these groups, or combined with the spike, we did not see any evidence of enhanced pathology. So in summary, we found that immunization with adenovirus that's expressing the nuclear capsid um, successfully induced humoral and T cell immune responses against the SARS-CoV-2 nuclear capsid antigen. We found that immunization against the nuclear capsid did not induce severe pulmonary pathology in mice after SARS-CoV-2 challenge, which is different from some previous publications. The immunization against the nuclear capsid actually resulted in lower body weight loss, 
uh, lower lung RNA titers and lower lung pathology scores in the mice that were challenged with SARS-CoV-2. And immunization with ADN1, so that's the nuclear capsid from SARS-CoV-1, which is expressing a nuclear capsid sequence that's not identical to the infecting virus. We found that this did not result in pathology or outcomes that were different from those involved, observed in mice that were immunized with the ADN2 or the nuclear capsid from SARS-CoV-2, which was a perfect match to the challenge virus. So when we combined the spike protein immunization with the nuclear capsid, this, this resulted in no body weight loss and better protection compared to the nuclear capsid alone. But what we did see, we saw slightly higher lung RNA titers in challenged mice following the nuclear capsid combined with spike compared to the spike alone. So this could suggest some sort of in slight interference of the nuclear capsid with the spike immune response, but it still is very effective at, at protection. And we saw no increased pathology um, compared to control mice in the nuclear capsid spike immunized mice, which is also a very... Um, important finding. So overall, what we're seeing here is from our data, this suggests that the inclusion of the nuclear capsid in the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine will not necessarily result in enhanced lung pathology following exposure. But I think the caveat here, because other people have reported it, is that the vaccine platform may influence the quality of the immune response. And this is what really needs to be looked at far more carefully. And, it, and, it, and it's really the T cell quality that should be considered, we feel, um, for future vaccine studies, not just the frequency of the T cell response, not just the, the numbers of T cells that people de de detect, but it's really the quality of that response that's most important. So I'd just like to acknowledge the people that did the work. Jae Kwan Kim did most of the work um, that I presented here today with help from Alakashko and Naveen Rajasagi. The challenge studies were done in Tony Wan's group by Prabhu Salvaraj and Brandon Stoft. David Rothstein did the histology analysis. I'd really like to thank the Division of Veterinary Services here in Cebu, who give us tremendous support for our studies. And the funding was from COVID-19 funds and FDA intramural funds. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Major. That was a uh, very insightful and interesting uh, information on the role of T cell responses in SARS-CoV-2 protection. Um, honestly, I felt like uh, uh, in uh, in a cla virology classroom, but very very useful. Um, I think we still have four minutes left, so there is a question on the uh, on the chat box. Uh, maybe I should go over that. Uh, it's from uh, Daniela. Thank you, Dr. Ma uh, Marianne. Uh, mm -hmm. Do your findings support the addition of nucleocapsid TOT or capsid to the vaccine? The mice seem to do worse than those that received S alone. Have you looked at the breadth of variant protection if the nucleocapsid is included? Right, so yes, that's a great question. Um, so we have not looked at the breadth of the response and that might be something that, that would be helpful going forward if people really do think that the use of the nucleocapsid is gonna add to the breadth. I mean, I think we're all very well aware of the variations in um, the spike protein that keep coming up and the need to keep looking at um, new variants and reassessing the vaccines that are currently out there. So I think that could be a really important consideration. And I think that given the results we had with the N1 and N2, I think this would actually possibly suggest that we might get some, some better protection. With respect to whether they support the addition of the nucleocapsid, I think that the goal of this work was to assess whether they support the non-addition. So whether there is a, a significant risk to the addition of the nucleocapsid. I think that, yes, we might see slightly lower protection compared to the spike alone, but that may still be good. And as you pointed out, it may even be better if you have a, uh, a different variant. So it may be broader, but slightly less um, effective at, at the exactly the same sequence. So 
Um, I, I do not think that we can say whether this supports the addition of a nuclear capsid, but I think it definitely gives us some encouragement that it is not going to result in a dangerous vaccine. Thank you. That's great. Uh, there is also another question, but I want to uh, move on in the interest of time, and we can uh, have this discussion at the end uh, because all the speakers uh, are staying back, so we can go over those questions uh, later. So with that, uh, I want to call the next speaker, uh, Dr. Jenna Osborne. She is from CDRH. And the title of her talk is the Development of Regulatory Science Tools to Accelerate Development of Medical Devices in Public Health Emergencies. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, so thank you, everybody. I am Jenna Osborne. I work within the Office of Science and Engineering Labs, um, or OSIL, within the Center for Devices and Radiological Health. I'm a scientific project manager um, in OSIL, but I also act as our program coordinator for our emergency preparedness program, which I get the privilege of sharing with you today about the work that's ongoing in the program. So before I start uh, specific, I want to give a little bit of a background on OSIL. Um, our mission is to accelerate patient access to innovative, safe, and effective medical devices through best-in-the-world regulatory science. Um, so this is an article that is um, was written by our center director, Dr. Jeffrey Shuren, and our office director, Dr. Ed Margerison. Um, and they uniquely pointed out that the rate of technology the technological advance of medical devices is fa accelerating faster than the science to review them and, and specifically the uh, evaluating the benefits of a, and risks of those devices. So that's what we're trying to um, uh, tackle within the Office of Science and Engineering Labs, developing um, those assessment methods that we can distribute to the public. We have about 20 different programs, um, and these are regulatory science research program areas within the Office of Science and Engineering Labs. Um, we have experts within particular um, medical fields like cardiovascular and neurology, but we also have programs within technological areas like artificial intelligence and machine learning or um, medical extended reality, for example. Um, so I, I, um, as I mentioned before, we have an emergency preparedness program. I'll share a little bit about what that program does um, in the coming slides, but I'd just like to highlight that, that um, in this session for medical countermeasures. Um, so I want to set the stage with introducing um, this topic that we call regulatory science tools. So these are innovative science-based approaches or methodologies that can help assess the safety or effectiveness of medical devices or emerging technologies. These can be phantoms, test methods, uh, software models, um, potential data or other recommended um, best practices. But these tools are meant, meant to be broadly applicable. So they're not just for a specific medical device and specific medical device submission, um, but they're meant to be um, broadly applicable to multiple or, or, or many um, medical device submissions. Uh, these can be used voluntarily through the entire um, product life cycle, all the way from discovery, ideation, um, through the post-market space as well. Um, but I just like to highlight that these do not replace FDA recognized standards. Um, these uh, are particular resources for companies, again, that can be voluntarily used throughout the, the product lifecycle. Um, and these may be a resource for innovators that where FDA recognized standards may not exist yet. Um, it's potentially perhaps a new field or emerging field um, that is is so new that we don't have the assessment te technology assessment needs right now, um, but this is meant to ease the burden on device developers for. De designing their own ad hoc test methods so that they can focus their limited resources on how well their product works rather than how it may be tested. Um, but these are meant to be an important uh, contribution to reducing risk in all stages of the product development, not just for the particular um, uh, uh, regulatory review cycle as well. 
We have a catalog that's publicly available. Um, the link is uh, displayed on the screen, um, but we have about 120 different uh, regulatory science tools that are able to be searched within our catalog currently. Um, they can be searched by the particular area if you're looking for a cardiovascular tool, for example, um, but also by the type. So if you're looking for a data set, a model, um, a lab method, or a phantom, that can also be searched as well. Um, and they're all listed on our catalog. So that's kind of the introduction to um, who we are in OSIL and what we do. Um, so I'd like to switch gears a little bit to um, particularly um, our emergency preparedness program. Um, so within CDRH, we had an incredible response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, this is an infographic for an ex for, as an example about all of the hard work that went on. Um, and this is just highlighting the achievements that were done between January um, and December 2020. But the work continued beyond that and is still ongoing. Um, so I would like to acknowledge all of the hard work that really um, came out of, of the, the pandemic response. Specifically within OSOL, um, we had we formed an emergency preparedness program, um, and this was directly in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The mission of our program is to advance the science tools and methods necessary to help um, develop and assess the safety and effectiveness of medical devices. Um, and, and these are specifically medical devices that are required in public health emergencies like the global pandemic. We have um, uh, more than 20 different personnel within our program, and we have expertise ran ranging from sterility and infection control um, all the way to additive manufacturing, just because we saw how big of an impact that COVID-19 had on our um our world, really. Uh, so it's a it's a lot of hard work that's ongoing within the program. These are just a couple of challenges that we're working to be a, to address um, within our uh, in our emergency preparedness program. Um, so one of them is the lack of methods, guidance, and standards around the assessment of pediatric PPE. The lack of standardized methods for the assessment of PPE shelf life. Um, the lack of assessment methods for additively manufactured medical products that are used in a medical in, in emergencies, and that includes PPE. Um, and then the lack of methods and recommendations for the assessment of infrared thermographs to measure elevated body temperatures as a screening tool. Um, so these are just a snapshot of a few projects that are ongoing um, to address these gaps. Um, but I would like to highlight one particular um, project that's ongoing within our program. And this is a tool to assist um, with design and testing of additively manufactured face coverings. So this work is, is has been performed by the group listed below, um, but I would like to highlight the, the people that come from um, the Office of Science and Engineering Laboratories, Drs. Ian Carr, Gavin DeSouza, Daniel Porter, and Prasanna Hariharan. Um, these are, they, they had an incredible, um, incredible amount of work and they've, they've done a lot of hard work and I, I get the privilege to share that with you today. Um, so to set the stage during the beginning of the pandemic, we saw a um, a large number of shortages in PPE and other medical devices due to the high demand. Um, so the AM community, they um, had produced and disseminated numerous types of um, devices that could be printed and used in, in that shortage time. Um, so this included face mask frames, ventilator components, um, face shields, ear savers, um, and even nasal swab designs. Um, and specifically highlighting on the additively manufactured face mask frames, um, these are uh, some of the designs that were were de designed. So there was actually a, a ton that were were distributed and and, and posted for for use. Um, but these the typical components uh, included this rigid mask frame that fits against your face. Um, the filter insert um, would then be a filtration material, um, and then you could print the filter mounting hardware to mount the the filter to the hard the rigid face mask, and then also the elastic strap so that it could, it could adhere to your face. Um, but some, there was a, like I said, there was a ton of different des designs that were out there. Some of them were user specific um, that allowed 3D scanning of your face. And then some of them were one size or variable sizing um, that could be printed um, for, for use. Um, but there was a couple of additional design elements that were implemented, like heat forming to improve fit or actually the addition of rubber or foam gaskets um, on the inside so it could it, it, uh, fit to your face um, and improve comfort as well. But of course, these came with some challenges. Um, because these are rigid face masks, they tended to have um, a variety of fit uh, uh, 
I guess they had a, a variety of different fits that were available, which I'll talk a little bit more about in the next coming slides. Um, but these, with the semi-rigid print materials, it was hard for it to completely adhere to your face. So there would be gaps that would be present. Um, this may be, a, it was a little bit difficult for some of these designs to um, uh, accommodate various wearing conditions like looking up and down, coughing or speaking. Um, and some of there were some challenges with comfort with the extended use. And generally these frames have a typical, like a smaller filter area, which uh, results in a larger pressure drop. And then that can potentially uh, lead to reduced filtration efficiency. Um, and in, without necessary precautions, these masks could um, have large gaps and that could imbue a false sense of protection for the wearer um, because this could, could these gaps could potentially uh, lead to infection of the wearer or, or others. Um, so that leads us to the project's objective is to de develop a tool that to be to be used in design and testing to evaluate the fit levels of new and existing additively manufactured face masks before manufacturing or even bench testing. So I'd like to highlight that this is not a replacement for the quantitative fit testing methods that are out there. Um, these are meant to uh, be used, but this tool was meant to be used by individuals or innovators that can modify their designs to uh, fit a wide variety of face shapes and sizes, again, before manufacturing or bench testing. So to give you an idea of some of the methods that were involved in this process, uh, it was a two two part simulation protocol. The first part includes a strap tensioning where you can see the strap um, uh, fits around a simulated head form. Um, and then as those, um, then it allows for the mask to slide and settle onto the, the head form. And then what comes out of that can be measured as um, where, the, where the mask is touching the head form, and then also quantifying that uh, leakage gap area so that we can assess the fit um, of, of that particular frame to a particular head form. So there are quite a bit of... Um, designs out there. So the first thing that the group tested was variable face mask designs. So you can see these are four uh, example um, designs that were available A, B, C, and D, um, and how they fit onto a, um, a, a medium head form. And you can see, you can assess the fit by the different designs. So you can see in mask A uh, that you are hoping for a black slash dark blue color. Um, that means that the the uh, fit is is better. And then if you go towards the red, that means that there's a larger gap between the, the frame itself and the face, the head form itself. So you can see within mask A, we've got a couple of gaps around the nose area. That's pretty common for some of these rigid mask designs to have uh, uh, gaps around the nose, but also by the chin, you can see here in mask B. Um, mask C, you can see there even some in the cheeks and, the, and of course the chin and the nose area as well. And then mask D, you can see the substantial gaps that are present uh, around the chin and the nose. And just to look at the quantifying leak area, leakage area gap area um, to see the difference across these maps. You can see the gap area gets larger from mask A to D, so D being the largest. Um, and the goal is to have a smaller uh, leakage gap area that that, in, that uh, elucidates a better fit for the mask. So in addition to different mask frame designs, um, they also looked into different size head forms. So there's a small, um, medium, and large head form. And they looked at a one size fits all uh, mask. Of, this is particularly mask C and looked how it, uh, they assessed the fit from um, the small, medium head. And you can see as the size of the head, change, head form changes, the mask does vary pretty dramatically. Um, and so then they also looked at variable sizing. So there were some masks that have variable sizing available for printing. So you can see that if they chose um, the appropriate variable size for the small, medium, and large head form, you can see the fit stays um, a little bit more consistent across the different size head forms. So this is something that can be used for um, assessing uh, uh, the head of a one size fits all, but also the variable sizing available as well. So just some highlights from the, the group. Uh, this simulation can help elucidate the quality of fit for these particular additively manuf manufactured face masks. Um, wide design variation, of course, results in a wide fit variation, as we saw uh, from the four different um, options. I didn't show these results within this um, particular uh, 
particular presentation, but they also looked at the addition of a foam gasket or other compliance materials. Um, and that they showed that that improved the fit and adaptability considerably of these particular rigid face masks. Um, variable sizing, they saw improves the fit across the diverse uh, facial morphologies. And then again, uh, just as a, as a, uh, as a, reiterating the message without some necessary precautions. Uh, these masks tend to have large gaps, as I, as I showed, between the, the nose and the chin area uh, most commonly. Um, and this could potentially uh, imbue a false sense of protection of the wearer. So this tool is something soon to be alive on our catalog, um, but I've highlighted here the contact information for the two, the, 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 uh, persons of contact for this particular tool. Um, and they also publish this findings within the annuals of biomedical engineering. If you're interested in checking out their, their, their particular publication with all of their results. Um, so this is just a highlight of some of the work that's going on within the emergency preparedness program where we're, um, working hard on other activities as well that I did not get a chance to highlight, but I encourage, um, you to check out our website and all of the work that's ongoing there. Um, we are also um, open to a, a, a dialogue to further understand some of the regulatory science gaps and challenges that um, are out there that is um, causing, causing trouble for researchers and innovators to bring devices to the market that are safe and effective. So with that, I would like to thank um, our emergency preparedness program team members. All of this hard work uh, couldn't have been done with possible without the, the people listed below. And I'd like to thank you for your attention today. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Looking forward to the discussion later today. Thanks, uh, Jenna. That was a very interesting and thorough uh, information on CDRH from the regulatory science tools to accelerate development of medical devices in public health emergencies. Um, we, there, are, there are a couple of questions, but we will discuss that at the end. In the interest of time, let me call the uh, fourth speaker for this uh, morning. Um, my apology if I mispronounce your name, uh, Dr. Daniela Wortley from CEDAR. She's going to talk to us on development of a platform approach to model neurotropic viral infections and characterize the therapeutics that target them. Dr. Vartelli. Thank you. And thank you for your kind invitation to talk uh, about our program. In this, hope, in, in this talk, I hope to briefly introduce you uh, to an animal model platform we are developing in our group that allows us to examine the impact of therapeutic and therapeutic attributes on viral infections. Most people have become aware um, over the last uh, three years of the immense uh, human and economic toll that a virus outbreak can can take, um, but if we take a historical look, we can see that there are that outbreaks of emerging and re-emerging uh, viruses are not uncommon. You can see, you know, SARS, Marlboro, swine flu, Ebola, yellow fever, um, Zika, um, that they have uh, emerged over the last twenty years with with quite a rapid um, progression, and uh, and. The intent of this slide is really to underscore the criticality of maintaining um, scientific manufacturing and uh, regulatory readiness to address this. Um, so as, as part of, of these efforts, we've been uh, developing uh, animal models because we think that animal models are critical in understanding uh, pathogenesis of infectious diseases and, and as well as, as performing preclinical evaluation of vaccines and therapeutics. And so the aim um, of, or, or one of the aims of, of our group is to develop um, a rapidly adaptable symptomatic testing platform to assess the, bio, the biological activity of different therapeutics and test novel combinations. Dr. Vartelli, yeah. yes. I didn't mean to disrupt uh, this uh, presentation. We, we don't see your slides unless- Oh my you goodness, have... I am so sorry. Thank you for um, letting me know. I thought I was sharing, but apparently it was not. Um, Perfect. Now we can uh, see the slide. I I apologize for that. Um, so 
let me retract a little bit. This is the chart that I was um, showing or trying to show uh, regarding the um, emerging and re-emerging infections. You can see the, the outbreaks of, of um, SARS, Marlboro, swine flu, Ebola, yellow fever, um, and of course, um, the COVID one that we are all um, very well aware of um, over the past few years. And I was um, trying to describe the um, model that we're trying to develop to um, to develop a, a rapidly adaptable symptomatic testing platform to assess the biological activity of different therapeutics and, and test novel combinations. And the advantages of having a, a, a platform approach is that we can have um, pre-established assays and outcomes and biomarkers of disease. And that allows us for very um, very rapidly assessing um, the impact of candidate therapeutics on infectious diseases and look at um, specific outcomes, and wh whether they are virological, neurological, ophthalmological, behavioral. Um, and in addition, it allows us to look at the impact of critical product attributes, um, such as uh, antibody isotype, uh, ADC, ADCC function, FC receptor, you know, how changes, for example, in glycosylation might impact um, the activity. Lastly, uh, but, but very importantly, it does provide a platform to understand the complexity of therapeutics um, of therapeutic-derived uh, virus evolution and fitness, um, and the potential risk of, um, of adaptation in, to ensure the continued efficacy of antiviral therapeutics of approved or authorized um, products. And an ideal platform uh, would be able to not only be ad adaptable to multiple viruses, but we wanted it to be symptomatic so that there was something that we can um, gauge the activity of the, of the products against. It was important for us that it would be immune competent so that we could test the ability of immunomodulatory products um, that um, are being developed. And lastly, it, it was important that it could be conducted uh, whenever possible in um, BSL-2 facilities as this would increase its applicability. Now, um, most uh, animal models that are used um, for infectious diseases are, are used in, in mice. Um, that's for a number of reasons. Not only is their immune system very well characterized, they, you know, they, they have a short life cycle, they're transgenic and, um, and, um, and knockout mice allow us to look at, at specific um, uh, the activity of specific molecules. The problem is that for many of the viruses that I mentioned um, as, as having you know, caused uh, outbreaks, there is really no available immune competent adult, adult mouse model. And that includes diseases like Lassa, Chikungunya, Ebola, Marlboro, Zika. So really very important pathogens. And here's an example. Um, using uh, Synbis virus, if we challenge the mice, you can see that there's no change in um, the uh, survival of the animals. The animals don't even become symptomatic. And that's because they can control the virus very quickly. So mo for most of these pathogens, um, traditionally people have resorted to the use of interferon deficient animals. In those animals, you can see that because they are immunodeficient, the animals uh, can develop an, a, a, an infection and uh, result, that results in symptomatology. Now, we thought that we could get around that uh, by, by exploiting a, um, a very small window of susceptibility that mice have. So while mice are usually resistant to, to these viruses, uh, there's a small window of susceptibility between birth and day three that we could exploit. And if we can infect the animals this early, it can result in disease and sequela. Um, and that uh, allows to gauge survival, viral loads, weight gain, or, or lack thereof. Um, and of course, um, monitor symptomatology, tumors, seizures, paresis, paralysis, what, whatever um, the result is of infections. And of course, characterize the disease using advanced te techniques uh, that includes histology, immunohistochemistry, gene expression, and so forth. Um, and uh, for many of these viruses, we can even develop long-term models to investigate 
um, the sequela. And you have to remember the sequela are both the result usually of the virus itself as well of the, the immune system um, that tries to deal with the virus. So th this um, models allow us to really look at that interaction and how it can be impacted. And the availability of um, uh, the, the, the capacity of being able to infect these um, early neonates in any type of mice allows us to use knockouts and transgenic mice. Um, and that allows us to understand what specific molecules are required, um, both for pathogenesis and for um, protection. And lastly, um, this is a, a model that allows us to test therapeutics. The only disadvantage, or, or one of the only disadvantages, is that it's not part a particularly good model to assessing um, vaccines, except for looking at um, adverse events, uh, because the, the infection needs to happen um, so early in life. So if we go back to our um, Synbis virus model, where we couldn't establish um, a, an infection in the adult mice, we see that we can do it in the neonatal mice. So this is mice at day seven. You can see that they are as resistant as adults. But if we infect them at day three of life, they become susceptible. They stop um, gaining weight. They develop uh, tumors and widened stands. They develop seizures and paralysis. And that's not because they can't their immune system is compromised. They, they can control the virus in the periphery. What they can't seem to control is the virus uh, expansion in the central nervous system. And that happens not just for Symbis, but for a number of other viruses. So we've been able to adapt the, the model for Takaribe, for Zika virus, for Dengue virus, um, and uh, for SARS as well as for e e Ebola. So now you can see that for most animals, we can use uh, Bob C or B6 mice. We usually use B6 because that's what most of our um, transgenic or knockout mice are on. So it becomes a very useful platform. For some models, such as the SARS model, we've had to use transgenic animals simply because the mice don't have the necessary receptor. But once we do that, we can look at um, the original virus as well as um, you know, we, we've been able to develop uh, models for uh, the alpha, beta, gamma, delta, omnicum variants. So it's a very plastic model. And in all of these animals, there are um, there is infection of the brain and the eye, um, and they are symptomatic. Um, and most of them are, are lethal, but in a number of them, we'd be able to develop long-term um, survivors to study the sequelae of disease. Now, to, sorry. To illustrate uh, the, the other um, important point that that I that I uh, describe when talking about the aims of of uh, developing this platform is the ability to test in BS in BSL two facilities instead of BSL three and BSL four, which would you know increase the the ability of people to to really work with these pathogens and, and understand them very well. And so we've, we've um, adapted the, the model by using pseudovirus, a, a pseudovirus approach that we'll describe in a minute. And that has allowed us to um, assess uh, therapeutics uh, for both SARS and Ebola in a BSL-2 environment rather than a BSL-3 and BSL-4. So we're going to use the Ebola model just to illustrate uh, what the, the uh, capabilities of this platform is. Now, you all know about uh, Ebola. You know that it's highly transmissible, that after a few days, uh, after exposure, patients develop fever, vomiting, diarrhea, uh, bleeding, results in or multiple organ failure, and, and then death in about 60 to 90% of, of the cases. Now, there's been a number of, of uh, small outbreaks uh, ever since the virus was described uh, in, in back in the 70s. But in 2014 and to 2016, there was a really a very large out, outbreak in, in Western Africa, and that led to the uh, development of vaccines in monoclonal antibodies, and that they that increase um, the survivability, and particularly for the latest uh, large outbreak in 2018, when they, um, the vaccine and the monoclonal antibodies were able to be deployed. Um, just to, to give you an idea, there's just two monoclonal antibodies that have been um, approved now uh, for Ebola, and they've been shown to reduce mortality quite a bit. The issue is that as we increase uh, survival of infected patients, um, we begin to see uh, or understand a lot more of the potential consequences of infection. So a number of patients um, 
to have persistent headaches, insomnia, dizziness, uh, anxiety, retinal lesions, cataracts, deafness. Um, so there's a number of, of neurological sequelae to, to this disease, as well as the concern about persistent uh, Ebola uh, uh, persistence of Ebola in immunoprivileged sites that includes testes, eyes, and brain, despite uh, the clearance from blood. And that, of course, presents challenges both regarding recrudescence and regarding um, a, a, a contagion to, to other people. So um, doing research in Ebola is, is currently not not easy. I mean, as I said, it, it requires a PSL4 containment. You can see the number of facility for, with PCL4 containment are very limited throughout the world. Uh, and of course, there's a number of biosecurity, safety, uh, and space limitations that go with it, um, as well as simply the physical constraint of, of executing research when, when you have to be totally gowned up. Um, and as I said, the murin model that was available uh, was only an immunocompromised mice, so it was not ideal. Um, so a lot of the studies really had to resort to the non-human private model. Um, and there, of course, there's, there's issues with availability, with the, the length that animals can be housed, and of course, with ethical issues. Um, so we, we decided to adapt our, our platform to, to test in, in these neonatal mice. And the way we did it is we took a virus that has a core for the vesicular stigmatitis virus, but the glycoprotein that uh, surrounds the virus and which determines what cells are going to be infected was replaced with the glycoprotein from Ebola Zaire. And so we have this serotype virus that is replicating, uh, re replicative, um, and can be used in BSL-2 uh, environment. Indeed, uh, a very similar compound was used, uh, is, would, uh, is, is uh, used as a vaccine for Ebola, and there's been no evidence of neurotropic infection vaccinated individuals. So it, this is pretty safe to use. Um, so if we then... Um, take this, this pseudovirus and infect our neonatal mice, you can see that the animals succumb to the infection. Uh, they don't succumb as quickly as they would if they were infected with VSV, or with, with the intact VSV, but they do succumb to infection. And it is really dependent on the glycoprotein that decorates the surface as those that are uh, where the glycoprotein is replaced with um, restin uh, glycoprotein, which is not lethal in humans, uh, also is not lethal in mice. Now, the animals can, uh, once again, uh, they clear the infection in the periphery, but cannot clear it from the brain and the eye. And that's what we're going to look at. Um, and you can see here on, on, on the bottom, which is the, the um, brains, the images of the brains of, of infected mice, you can see that the virus is particularly located in mid and hind brain, and that it results in both the accumulation of um, immune cells in the area and uh, a clearance of uh, glia. So there's reduction in glia and there's inflammation um, that is what is b behind the, these disease. And we can look in more detail and see that it's really the neurons that are infected. So here we are sort of zeroing in on, on the cerebellum. You can see that the, the um, the neurons uh, in the uh, granular layer, as well as Purkinje cells, uh, are infected, and that results in uh, increase of apoptosis of or, del uh, or cell death, as seen here in green. And you, here you can see it in, in more detail. You can see that the the, um, the Purkinje cell is infected, but not the surrounding astrocytes. We can then do more detailed studies, looking at what cells uh, are infiltrating the area and characterizing what the immune response is by not just looking at the gene expression of immune-related uh, genes, but we can also, and, and that's, this is something uh, very interesting that, that we've been uh, involved in lately, uh, looking at the how the infection impairs the neurological development and how that is uh, affected by the infection, short term and long term. Now, in the eye, we can see um, that the um, viral infection results in, in a uh, gradual accumulation of virus in the retina. You can see bipolar, mueller, and horizontal cells getting infected, and it ultimately results in a disruption of the retina. So, Having uh, developed this model, we can then um, use it to ask, you know, how do therapeutics, um, how can therapeutics really uh, impact on the disease? And I'm showing you results of two different experiments. The first one is using a therapeutic candidate, which was a monoclonal antibody 
uh, named 139, which came from a transchromosomic a humanized cow um, that was uh, immunized against Ebola. And you can see that the, the antibody was able to improve survival um, after a single dose quite effectively in, in our mouse model, as uh, was able to, the, and, and similarly, the use of poly IC, which induces interference, was also able to protect uh, the animals from infection. So both using a monoclonal antibody or an immunomodulatory product, we could see that there was a, a, an impact on the disease. And you can see here that there's a reduction both uh, in, in the viral load in hindbrain, as well as in the amount of uh, apoptosis. And you can see that there's a, a clear reduction in viral load in the brain uh, that goes together with a reduction in the inflammatory signature. So um, now this was one monoclonal antibody, um, but that, that's uh, one monoclonal antibody, uh, sorry, polyclonal antibody that we had tested, but we wanted to know how that compared with um, monoclonal antibodies, such as the ones that have been approved. And uh, we were able to obtain some monoclonal antibodies from Regeneron. So uh, what you see here as MAP1 is a non-neutralizing antibody that has ADCC activity. Um, and MAP2 is a neutralizing antibody with no ADCC activity. So again, you know, this ability of, of allowing it to, to look at critical aspects of, uh, of the products. And we can see that um, whether we gave the the um, the polyclonal antibody or any of the monoclonal antibodies or the combination, all of them resulted in improved survival. Now, when we looked at the eye, the story was a little different. Um, you can see that the ability of the different antibodies to clear the virus from the eye was, was somewhat different with um, SAP sort of being intermediate, MAP1, which was not neutralizing, not being very good at clearing, MAP2 being a little bit better, and the combination being um, quite good. So, um, you know, does this really have uh, an influence long term? And that's important because, you know, this, as, as I mentioned before, ocular um, sequelae are very important uh, in survivals. And, you know, whatever we can do to understand um, what sequelae is, I, I think can help us choose what. Uh, avenues of, of treatment sh should be taken. So, so to address that, we, we uh, generated a, a sublethal uh, BSL-2 model of, of infection. Basically, what we did is we tinkered with the, with the challenge dose um, to get it to a place where we did see um, an infection that was similar in scope or, or in magnitude to that of the um, full dose infection, but um, barely sublethal so that we only got uh, a 40%, a about a 40% survival. So we could use this 40% of mice to then um, assess what the um, consequences would be. And we were able to apply a number of, um, uh, of um, behavioral studies in the adult mice to look at um, the impact, and um, you can see here the open field tests, what are called an elevated plus maze and, and rotor, and these are just examples of the suite of behavioral uh, and memory tests that we, we can use. And you can see that the animals that were um, infected um, had evidence of hyperactivity, and you can see, you know, this is sort of the trace of, of the movement of, of the animal in, inside the box. And this is a normal animal. This is a, 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 an animal that was infected early in life. You can see that it's hyperactive. And you can also see that once you treat it, the animal sort of reverts um, to a much normal pattern. And the same can be seen uh, in the elevator. Uh, plus maze where you can see that the, the mouse uh, sends uh, more time than it should in the open arm. And that again, that behavior again reverts um, quite a bit with, with treatment. Um, and lastly, um, the same can be seen in rotor rod where the animals uh, sort of have to uh, sort of climb this sort of endless stair in the rotor rod. Um, and, and that really um, has to do with, with, the, uh, with strength and, and with equilibrium. And you can see See that it's it's fairly diminished in the animals that were infected. Um, so they, they have sequelae in those area, but it, if they had been treated, they um, they revert to a normal behavior. Now, with regards to the eyes, um, as I mentioned before, cataracts in in retinal lesions are are um, some of the sequelae that, that we see in patients. And so we looked at what would happen in, in, um, in these animals. And you can see here, you know, this is the viral load um, in the um, animals with sublethal doses of Ebola, 
six months post infection. You can see that the RNA, the number of RNA copies of, of the virus, you can see you know, this is, of course, your control. This is an infected control. This is high levels of virus in the eye. If you apply the, um, the polyclonal antibody, you had some um, eyes that, that had a significant amount of virus. If you use the MAP1, the non-neutralizing, you see the same, but with the MAP2 or the combination, uh, this was fairly diminished. Now, how does that translate clinically? Um, so this is what an uninfected... Um, Dr. Wardley? Yes. I'm sorry to uh, interrupt. Uh, I need to conclude because you're already seven minutes over the time. Okay. So <laughs> let's, let me um, just finish by saying that the ocular, uh, the long-term ocular sequela really differs by MAP treatment and that um, generating platform antibodies, um, it really helps for uh, enhanced assessment of symptom of, of disease and um, just thank the people that were involved in the project. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was very impressive work and Appreciate sharing with us the neurotropic viral infections and therapeutics that target them. Uh, so we have come to the last uh, speaker, but not uh, least, and he's one of my colleagues from NCTR, Dr. Dayton Pettibone. He's been working with uh, Zika virus for a while, and he's going to share with us uh, his work on testicular organoids as a model for a Zika virus infection. Dayton. Great, thank you for that introduction and the opportunity to um, present my research today. Can you see my slides? Yes, and hear you well as well. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, so the outbreak of Zika virus in the Americas demonstrated how a relatively obscure mosquito-borne disease can become a global health emergency with infections resulting in congenital Zika syndrome in unborn children. Interestingly, in addition to being a mosquito-borne virus, Zika virus also infects the male reproductive tract and can be spread sexually. To address Zika virus sexual transmission, my lab is developing and evaluating testicular organoids uh, as models of Zika virus infection that can be applied to preclinical testing of anti-Zika therapies. So as a little background, Zika virus is a bloodborne flavivirus virus first identified in the rhesus macaque in 1947. It was later identified in humans in Uganda and the United Republic of Tanzania. And since then, outbreaks of Zika have been reported in tropical Africa, Southeast Asia, and the Pacific Islands, uh, as well as in the Americas. Um, so Zika is predominantly spread through the human population by mosquitoes. However, in addition to being a mosquito-borne virus, Zika can also infect the male reproductive tract and replicate in the immune-privileged testes to be spread sexually outside of endemic areas. There is no evidence of sexual transmission for any other arthropod-borne virus, making Zika virus unique in this respect. The Zika virus can remain in the female reproductive tract and remain there for several months, being vertically transmitted to the offspring, which could result in negative pregnancy outcomes. Our development of MPS to evaluate Zika virus infections and anti-Zika therapies focus on a sexual transmission, specifically by using rhesus macaque primary cells from the testes to generate testicular organoids. As models of, uh, as in vitro models of Zika virus infection, viral replication, and release. So, for Zika virus diseases, most people who become infected with Zika uh, do not become sick, and those that do generally develop mild symptoms such as fever, rash, and conjunctivitis. However, there is an increased risk for uh, Guillain-Barre. Uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, which is a neurological condition in which the immune system attacks peripheral nerves and can result in muscle weakness and sometimes paralysis. The 2015 to 2017 outbreak revealed infections could cause severe clinical manifestations in, in fetuses and newborns. Collectively, these are referred to as congenital Zika syndrome, which are a distinct pattern of birth defects and disabilities, including microcephaly, and pregnancy complications such as fetal loss, stillbirth, and preterm birth. 
microcephaly is a condition in which the infant's head is significantly smaller than expected, often due to abnormal brain development. Symptoms vary and include intellectual disability and speech delay to seizures and abnormal muscle functionality in severe cases. At present, there is no FDA-approved Zika virus vaccine or antiviral medication. However, numerous therapies are in development. Zika virus is also listed as a WHO priority disease that poses the greatest um, public health risk due to its epidemic potential and insufficient countermeasures to the 5 to 15% of infants born to women, to Zika virus infected women, uh, that have evidence of Zika virus complications. So why are we developing a, a non-human primate testicular organoid model as abbreviated thusly throughout the um, presentation? And as Daniela pointed out in her presentation, that's because wild type rodents cells are, are refractory to Zika virus infection. This is because the uh, Zika virus NS5 protein does not inhibit uh, STAP protein mediated interferon antiviral signaling in response to infection, allowing the virus to establish infection. Rodents must generally be infected following uh, gene knockout of the interferon alpha beta uh, receptor or following uh, drug induced immuno. Um, immunosuppression. And while significant mechanistic data pertaining to Zika virus infection and pathogenic effects have been collected using modified rodent models for Zika infection, the responses in these rodents is often much more severe than what is it observed in humans or in non-human primates. However, the Zika virus infections in the rhesus macaque um, also infect the male reproductive system and exhibit similar pathologies to humans, including, including the pregnancy complications. Additionally, reservoirs of Zika virus infection in the testes might complicate development of therapeutics and proposed anti-Zika uh, antiviral therapies should be evaluated for their ability to, to clear persistent infection in the testes uh, once these models are more mature. The model using the testicular organoids to ev evaluate anti-Zika countermeasures might also reduce the demand for in vivo non-clinical safety and efficacy studies in non-human primates, thus promoting the principles of the three R's. And as a 2023 publication by the National Academies reported, the availability of non-human primates for research for both public health and national security are at critically low levels. So for this set of experiments, the testes from a single macaque were collected from a separate completed study. The cells were enzymatically dissociated from the testicular tissues and exposed to uh, Zika virus or mock infection controls. The cells were then seeded into a microwell system shown here in the 24 well plate format with each well having 1,200 micro wells to generate the organoids. And uh, the testicular organoids were generated um, at 500 cells per organoid. As shown here, the cells coalesce to form the organoids after only two days of culture. Uh, additionally, they maintained their morphology throughout the entire culture interval. So the Zika virus infected or mock infection control organoids were then cultured for 21 days and sampled at predetermined time points. The Zika virus RNA was analyzed in both the organoids and in the supernatant by qPCR. And the supernatants were also used to measure cytotoxicity, testosterone in hibin B and cytokine release. Um, briefly, before I get into the Zika virus infectivity, uh, I'd like to mention that we evaluated the testicular organoids and found that they contain um, gene expression markers for Sertoli cells, Leydig cells, spermatogonial stem cells, and undifferentiated germ cells. Additionally, they maintained consistent ATP levels throughout the 21-day culture interval. The testicular organoids were also able to respond to cytotoxic stress over the 21 days. 
So we demonstrated Zika virus infectivity using the uh, PRV ABC 59 strain uh, after optimization of the infectivity. The optimization was performed using a broad range, broad range of infection conditions covering an MOI of 0 0.25 which is one infectious virus per four cells up to an MOI of 14, which is 14 infectious virus per cell, and evaluated the results for consistency. Uh, we found that the MOIs of three, five, and seven were uh, selected because the results um, were consistent and had acceptable fluctuations in their infectivity. The infectivity was evaluated through 21 days of culture and revealed that the supernatants and organoids had levels of Zika RNA at levels between one times 10 to the second and near one times 10 to the fifth copies per mil throughout the culture interval. And this is several times the Zika virus half-life, which with its low thermal stability is about 11 hours in culture at 37 degrees. These data are also similar to clinical studies, revealing that the Zika virus and infected men, the viral RNA levels in the semen were one times 10 to the fifth copies per mil, and in the blood were about nine times 10 to the third copies per mil. Next, we look at the deleterious effects of Zika virus in the testicular cells by evaluating cytotoxicity, as well as looking at testosterone and inhibin B release as indicators of metal metabolic function in Leydig cells and Sertoli cells, respectively, in the infected non-human primate testicular organoids over the culture interval. Cytotoxicity was measured as release of a cytotoxic enzyme from the uh, infected testicular organoids and compared to the mock infection controls we found that the cytotoxicity levels remain consistent, which is expected as Zika virus demonstrates the ability to infect the non-human primate testicular models and in vitro Sertoli cells without cytopathic effect. Testosterone production also remained consistent uh, throughout the infection and was not significantly different from mock infection controls, but there was a significant uh, effect of culture time on testosterone accumulation between day two and days nine uh, five and or days five and nine through 21, indicating Leydig cells in the testicular organoids are metabolically active. Likewise, inhibin B uh, release remained stable across MOIs, but the inhibin B levels were significantly decreased uh, as a function of time compared to day two of the culture, indicating possible decreases in Sertoli cell metabolic activity. And this might be due to a lack of follicle stimulating hormone in the media, which would stimulate inhibin B uh, release from the cells. And these findings uh, agree with previous studies indicating that testosterone and inhibin B levels were minimally affected in Zika virus infected men following um, and in Zika virus testicular implants, while some in vivo testicular uh, some in vivo non-human primate and human testosterone serum levels following Zika and virus, Zika virus infection are somewhat mixed. So to further characterize the Zika virus infection in the non-human primate testicular organoids, cytokine secretion levels in the supernatants were evaluated using a panel of 27 um, cytokines. Here are twofold or greater change in secreted levels or a p-value of less than 0 0.05 was considered significant. Overall, Zika virus infections altered the cytokine secretions um, either as decreases or increases as a function of time, which peaked at day nine, and the number of cytokines began to decrease after that. We also observed an imbalanced inflammatory response with increased pro-inflammatory cytokines, such as IL-6, IL-8, and IL-15 being secreted without a secretion of anti-inflammatory cytokines, such as IL-1, IL-4, or IL-10. Additionally, several adaptive immunity cytokines also had altered uh, secretion following infections, such as VEGF and RANS.
So in summary, uh, the non-human primates contained the key cell types found in the in vivo testes. Um, the uh, testicular organoids we found were also suitable for detection of ATP, cytotoxic responses, testosterone and inhibin B release, and cytokine secretion. The Zika virus was the Zika virus replicated and was detected within the testicular organoids and the supranatans. The Zika virus in the non-human primates did not alter cytotoxicity or affect the testosterone or inhibin B release levels. And we observed modest alterations in cytokine secretion. Uh, we conclude from this that these data demonstrate the non-human primate testicular organized potential for non-clinical study of Zika virus infection. So where we think the non-human primate testicular organoids might find use in non-clinical studies uh, is by expanding therapy testing for rare diseases and to establish strategies to reduce demands for non-human primates. The key benefits that the non-human primate testicular development provide to regulatory science are to assess pathogenic infections, complement animal studies for use in study design planning, candidate therapy and dose selection, interpreting toxicity data for organ-specific toxicity before committing to animal studies, as well as provide cross-comparisons of in vivo animal and human data uh, to identify species-specific effects, as well as to build confidence in human in vitro models for regulatory use. And we think that the impact of this research could be um, as a model of viral infection used to facilitate therapeutic and vaccine development and testing. So in our future plans, uh, we're going to establish a, a simplified model of Zika virus sexual transmission uh, using the organ chip shown here, which contains two compartments linked by a microfluidic chip. The um, compartment one will contain uninfected or infected testicular organoids, and compartment two will contain the neurospheres, which are the, uh, the targets of Zika virus infection that have the pathogenic effects. So we will then uh, monitor the Zika virus infected system for uh, circulating Zika virus uh, particles, as well as looking at um, the infectivity, cytotoxicity, and metabolic function in the system. And we have already done some preliminary work in this, culturing the, the testicular organoids and the um, testicular organoids and the neurospheres, both singly and in co-culture. And uh, really, so this is a work that's in the exploratory stages, and we're trying to see what kind of information we can get from the 3D cell structures, and if that data is reproducible. Um, and with that, I would like to acknowledge my collaborators at NCTR, as well as my uh, co-investigator, Maria Rios, who did um, the, the majority of the virus work, and our funding through the Medical Countermeasures Initiative, and I will be happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, during the the Q and A session. All right, thanks, Dayton, for sharing your data on the testicular organoids as a model for Zika virus infection. That concludes the presentation. So we jump into Q and A. We have four minutes, and there are six questions. I will see uh, how fast we can do this. Uh, let's start with. Uh, Okay, this must be for Dr. Major. Can you speculate a bit on the meaning of quality of T cell response? For example, is it to which antigen the T cell is responding? Maybe functional T cell assays would help uh, elucidate? Right, yes, thanks uh, for that question. So it's less um, about the antigen that's being targeted and more about the markers that are on the T cells. So yes, you can do functional assays for T cells, um, but they are very difficult to do. You can do them in mice because often you can get matched cells, but in humans, it's very difficult because the um, genetic differences 
that you have to have and the T cells have to match the, the cells that they're targeting. So let me just say, first of all here, um, there's been a lot of talk about T cells for SARS-CoV-2 against the spike, and there's been a lot of talk about it. But T cell assays and T cell analysis is at least 10 times as difficult to do as antibody analysis. And so there are a lot of known markers on T cells and cytokine production from T cells once they're um, stimulated that can be looked at. For example, there's the interleukins like IL-4, IL-10, I have two twelve that give you some idea of the function. There are surface markers that will give you ideas of the memory markers, whether those T cells will function for a long time and later on when they're actually exposed to virus. Um, another type of marker is an activation marker or cytotoxic function markers like um, granzyme B and perforin. Th those are all done by fax analysis. And then there are some groups that are developing these um, FAC systems that are looking at more than 20 markers. It just gives you an idea of how extensive the different marker systems are on T cells. But that's really what I'm talking about in terms of looking at the quality, is looking at some of these markers and seeing if there's a difference between these different vaccine platforms. Great, thanks. Okay, this question is for uh, uh, Dayton. Uh, what is the rationale for generating uh, M. mulata organoids rather than human, since the end goal is presumably to generate the most human relevant data possible? Right. So um, there is a lot of interest in, within FDA to develop the animal models of these MPS for comparisons to um, the in vivo data which can then be extrapolated to uh, the um, using the human MPS models um, to predict clinical outcomes in the uh, in humans. Um, so there's that aspect of it. An another aspect of it is that while we would love to to uh, have that model set up to use the humans uh, side by side with the um, in mulata testicular organoids, the the uh, the fact is that human testicular tissues are are, are very difficult to uh, to to procure for um, these experiments. Great, thanks. Uh, I guess it's ten, well, I guess eleven a.m. So that concludes uh, session six. And I want to thank all the speakers for their excellent presentation. And thanks to 195 attendees for attending. And I will see you all at session seven this afternoon. I am uh, moderating that session. Uh, if not, uh, please do attend any one of the other sessions. Uh, exciting uh, talks are lined up this afternoon. See you all and have a pleasant afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.
Welcome everyone to the 2023 FDA Science Forum, session number eight, Substance Use, Misuse, and Addiction. My name is Eric Harvanko, and I'll be introducing our speakers and moderating a question, answer, and discussion period following the presentations. If you have any questions, please submit them via the Q&A box, and we will address them following the presentations. We have seven presentations scheduled covering the topic of the session from a variety of perspectives and from outside and within several FDA centers. Before we begin the presentations, we have an introduction to the session by the Deputy Center Director for Substance Use and Behavioral Health within the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, Dr. Marta Sokolowska. Go ahead, Dr. Sokolowska. Good afternoon and uh, welcome to the session eight of substance use, misuse and, and addiction. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for the hard work and putting together this session. Um, as uh, we have heard over the past two days, the FDA Science Forum showcases the innovative research and collaborative efforts of FDA scientists and our external partners. And during this session, speakers will highlight how cutting edge science and research inform our regulatory decision making uh, and drive innovation to combat substance use, misuse, and addiction. But before we jump into the research, I would like to provide some framing regarding the crisis of substance use, which remains one of the country's most pressing public health concerns and uh, top priority for the FDA. Um, as we know, um, tobacco use remains the leading preventable cause of death um, and disease in the United States, uh, leading to more than 480,000 deaths each year. Furthermore, according to provisional data from CDC, we've lost an estimated 108,000 lives to overdose in the 12 months ending in September 2022. While 80,000 of those fatal overdoses included opiates, polysubstance use has played an increasing role in this overdose crisis. Taken together, these tremendous, this is a tremendous opportunity and responsibility for FDA and for all of us to use scientific research and collaborative efforts in support of innovation and evidence-based policies that prevent these strategies and pave the way for safer future. Now I would like to tell you about some of our policy work um, and we'll briefly highlight how scientific findings contribute to our data-driven uh, decision-making. Last August, we established the FDA Overdose Prevention Framework uh, as an agency-wide wide, agile and comprehensive strategy to address the evolving public health crisis. We continue to evolve our approach and make adjustments according to the latest available science and data. We focus our work on four priorities, supporting primary prevention, encouraging harm reduction, advancing evidence-based treatments for substance use disorder, and protecting the US from drug supply from unapproved, diverted, or counterfeit drugs. I want to share a few of our recent actions where we identified knowledge gaps, sought out opportunities for innovation and collaboration, and used science to support policy changes and improve public health. FDA's decision on product applications rely on quality science. Following multiple um, disciplinary reviews of the data, we recently approved a new extended release buprenorphine medication for opioid use disorder, a novel nasal spray for opioid overdose reversal, uh, nalmefine, uh, and uh, first non-prescription nasal spray uh, for, to treat uh, opioid overdose. In April and May, FDA recommended revisions to product labels for both prescription opiates and stimulants, respectively, based on updated scientific evidence. These changes promote safer prescribing of these drugs and aim to minimize non-medical use, um, addiction, overdose, and sharing of medication. Finally, with the support of the Regan Oral Foundation, um, we held two public workshops to identify research gaps and product development opportunities to better understand emerging approaches to treatment for addiction and overdose. In March, workshop exploring the landscape and epidemiological trends, emerging science and public health intervention for uh, managing overdose. And in May, workshop explored um, 
scientific evidence and real world evidence for uh, buprenorphine initi initiation and management strategies and products needs for the treatment of opioid use disorder, particularly as we understand the landscape for substance use is very much changing. So substance use, misuse, and addiction have tremendous impact on our collective well-being, and there are still many opportunities to improve the way we address these challenges. Throughout our efforts together, we can you know, develop and utilize groundbreaking science and technology to combat threats to public health. We are fortunate to be able to come together to engage in discussion and leverage the power of science and research to find solution alongside our peers from sister agency, industry, academia, community and harm reduction organizations, as well as patients and systems that support them. So uh, I look forward to hearing from our colleagues throughout FDA, as well as uh, the National Institute on Drug Abuse and the University of Vermont about the research that they have been conducting. These efforts are vital to our understanding the challenges we face and develop impactful solutions to improve people's lives. FDA stands strong in our commitment to fund, support, and learn from great research. These important accomplishments depend on all of us um, and on the science. So thank you again for joining our, our today's sessions, and I hand it back to you. Thank you for that introduction, Dr. Sokolowska. Our first presentation will be given by Dr. Stephen Higgins. Dr. Higgins is the Virginia H. Donaldson Professor of Translational Science in the Departments of Psychiatry and Psychological Science at the University of Vermont. He has served as principal investigator on numerous NIH grants and NIDA FDA Tobacco Center's the Regulatory Science Award. He has authored approximately 400 peer-reviewed articles with over 20,000 citations, and his trainees include past and present FDA scientists. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Stephen Higgins. Thank you, Eric. It's a real pleasure to be part of this um, panel, and many thanks to the FDA for the invitation to do so. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. <clears throat> and um, uh, well, I'm not getting the, uh, let me see here. There we go. And now you should be seeing my slides, hopefully. So as you see here, um, went faster. I'm gonna be addressing abuse liability testing with humans using reduced nicotine content cigarettes as an exemplar. Sorry, Dr. Higgins, we yeah. don't see your slides. You don't. No. Uh, uh, let me try here again now. So uh, back to... Um, sharing my screen and I want to go here and then I want to view this as a uh, slideshow. So I am, do you see anything now with, from my slides? No, not yet. Okay. Then I going over to my slides and I am Go into slideshow. Yes. Now you see my slides? Uh, please click on this uh, share screen, Error. the Zoom. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Okay. Yeah, we see. So we're all good now. Yeah, just go uh, from the beginning on the top of your uh, PowerPoint, you see a slideshow. You see the slideshow on the top. Uh -huh. Just one more on the right. Oh, I do not see my slideshow here. Okay, right below the cursor. Yep. Um, Sharon. No, sorry for this. I am. I am not. No problem. No problem. Uh, you know, you you see the home, then insert, draw, yes, design, yes. transition, animation, then the slideshow. Please. Oh, click now I see it. Yes, it was covered. Yeah. With... And then from beginning, play from the start. On the left-hand side of the... Oh, play from the start. Okay. Wonderful. Now you see my slides. Wonderful. Thank you so Wonderful. much. Wonderful. Thank you for the coaching there. Thank you. All right. So um, as you see on my slide here, hopefully, um, I'm going to be addressing abuse liability testing with humans using, using reduced nicotine content cigarettes as an exemplar. 
The um, in way of disclosures, I have research support, which uh, Eric just mentioned, and I have nothing else to uh, declare. The research I'm going to share with you is team science. I've been very fortunate to have excellent faculty collaborators, as well as postdoctoral and predoctoral fellows uh, who made the, the research I'm going to show uh, possible. Um, so before going into my own research, I just wanted to mention some um, fundamentals of abuse liability testing. Um, at least my list of favorite fundamentals. Uh, double blind testing is critically important, um, as is inclusion of a positive control of a known abused or addictive substance, in, uh, often with analgesic abuse liability testing, for example, the positive control is morphine. You wanna test a range of doses of the new drug or the new drug formulation and ideally start with acute dosing under controlled clinical laboratory test conditions. You wanna use participants with appropriate uh, drug abuse histories in this area of research, they're the experts. Um, you wanna conduct direct tests, the relative reinforcing effects, um, i.e. drug self-administration if possible. It's also, um, essential to use validated visual analog scales and questionnaires assessing uh, positive mood, euphoria, as well as untoward effects. Um, it's convention to include vital signs and if possible, uh, assess time course. And within subject and parallel group designs are both effective. And in fact, I'll show you examples of each in my own research. Um, I also wanted to point out that there are excellent um, resources in the peer-reviewed literature across these different types of research. So Sandy Comer did an excellent paper on clinical laboratory studies. Um, I give the citation here in 2012. These are just examples. Uh, O'Connor and colleagues did a um, or put out a, also a very good paper on abuse liability testing in clinical trials. And I'm going to show example of that. And then uh, Pergolesi um, and, and colleagues um, more recently published a report on um, how you can uh, develop abuse deterrent uh, formulation of opioids, um, you know, which are obviously of great interest in, in the current uh, and ongoing opioid epidemic we have. Okay, so now turning to my own research, um, I want to, uh, I'm going to be talking about tobacco regulatory science. So that began in 2009 when the Family Smoking Prevention and Tobacco Control Act was passed by the U.S. Congress, and this granted the FDA regulatory authority over the manufacture and distribution of tobacco products in the United States. And that was for the reasons that were mentioned in the introduction of this session. It was a profoundly important development because uh, cigarette smoking is the largest preventable cause of premature uh, death in the U.S. Um, Within with this authority, FDA can reduce, although unfortunately not eliminate, nicotine content in cigarettes or other products if they can demonstrate that doing doing so will protect the um, U.S. public health. So this uh, concept of nicotine reduction can be connected back to a prescient essay uh, by two really well-known uh, tobacco researchers, Neil Benowitz and Jack Henningfield, in the 1994 New England Journal of Medicine Commentary, where they pro propose that um, reducing the non nicotine content of cigarettes uh, below a, an addiction um, level or threshold. And their hypothesis was that if the nicotine content in cigarettes could be reduced to 0.7 milligrams of nicotine per, per gram of tobacco, uh, the cigarette should be non or minimally addictive. And as you'll see in a research that I showed, that was a pretty darn good hypothesis. It wasn't just blind hypothesizing. They were using uh, many years of careful research that had been done on nicotine with humans and, and non-humans. 
So the uh, FDA has now, with this authority, funded studies in the general population of adults and adolescents who smoke, as well as highly vulnerable population, that is populations that have greater uh, risk for initiating and continuing smoking and also smoking-related adverse effects. And the results from these studies support the potential feasibility and efficacy of a, a policy. And what I mean by that is they show um, evidence that reducing nicotine content reduces the reinforcing value of smoking. It reduces smoking rate, which is an indicator of reinforcing value, decreases dependent severity, nicotine dependent severity, which is one of the best predictors of success in quitting should somebody try to quit, and it increases attempts to quit. So I'm going to review studies that I led in vulnerable populations. That's our, we have a T cores, and that's the group that we focus on. And again, these are populations that have an increased likelihood of initiating smoking and also experiencing smoking-related adverse health conce uh, consequences. All right. So we started um, with acute exposure, and this is a study that was published in JAMA Psychiatry. I use the phrase addiction potential in the um, title, but it's interchangeable with abuse liability. And so um, I would think one of the innovations is that we could take methods that were established for uh, assessing abuse liability with opioids, new analgesics, and um, bring them over to the newly established uh, Center on Tobacco Products within the FDA to research uh, nicotine reduction and whether reducing nicotine does indeed decrease the abuse liability of cigarette smoking. So the three populations we work with are um, socioeconomically disadvantaged women. We operationalize that by uh, lower education, high school or less. Um, and then people who have comorbid uh, psychiatric conditions, we use affective disorders to, uh, which is one of the most prevalent forms of mental illness in the United States. And we also look at people who have comorbid other substance use disorders using opioid use disorder because tremendously high smoking rate, greater than 90% smoking prevalence in those who have opioid use disorder. So in the research I'm sharing here in this study, um, participants completed 14 two to four hour experimental sessions in a, uh, within subject research design. So looking across those three populations, we had 169 um, participants. Sessions were conducted following brief smoking abstinence, and that's about six to eight hours, and it's operationalized as um, a one half reduction in their baseline um, breath carbon monoxide level. And then um, we conducted two to three uh, sessions per week uh, with usually uh, at least 24 hours between a session. And we're looking at using four research cigarettes that go by the name of Spectrum uh, cigarettes. They were provided to us from the National Institute on Drug Abuse and manufactured uh, under the auspices of the 22nd Century Group. And these cigarettes appear identical visually and, and, and to the touch, but they vary in nicotine content from a very low dose of 0 0.4 milligrams of nicotine per gram of tobacco, um, all the way up, and that's below that hypothesized threshold of 0.7, all the way up to 15.8 milligrams per gram of tobacco. And that's a, uh, that's our positive control. That's a a dose that's representative of tip, um, uh, typical commercial cigarettes in the marketplace today and uh, very capable of producing addiction. We're testing under double blind conditions. And um, in the way we structured these sessions is the first five sessions were what we call exposure session, exposure sessions to the uh, test uh, substances. So the first session is just an orientation session. We had the uh, participants use their own uh, usual brand cigarette, and then they smoke ad lib. They smoke that cigarette ad lib, but through a filter that allows us to assess smoking topography. 
And then they, um, in the next four sessions, they are going to smoke um, one cigarette at each of these doses. The cigarettes are identified by arbitrary letter codes and everything's counterbalanced um, across participants. So no letter is uniformly associated with a particular dose. And um, we encourage the participants to pay attention to how the different uh, letter-coded cigarettes make them feel, because in um, future sessions, they're going to have a chance to choose to smoke between these different uh, dose conditions. And then we, after each exposure session, we have them complete different uh, questionnaires, uh, self-report questionnaires. And then um, from that phase of exposure, we move into the self, what we call self-administration phase, and that's we're doing concurrent choice testing. So we're going to do devote six sessions to that, and each dose pair, each dose is going to be uh, paired in a self-administration session, again, just by letter code, and participants in these th three-hour sessions can smoke as often um, as they wish, and they can choose between which cigarette they want to smoke by just doing a couple mouse clicks on the uh, um, a logo designated designating uh, one of the two cigarettes. And then we do controlled puffing uh, just to keep everything constant across the different cigarettes. And I think that gives you enough to uh, get into the results. And I'm going to start with the self-administration sessions because I think the data is quite strong and, and compelling. I hope you, you see it the same way. So on the x-axis, on the y-axis, I'm showing a proportion of choices. Remember, these are where the participants can show us their preference for which cigarette uh, they'd like to smoke. And um, so what we had, the way we have the x-axis is the different dose pairs, and we have them ordered by the largest difference in, if you look at the um, pair of bars that's leftmost on your screen, 0.4 versus 15.8, lowest and highest doses, and that's the largest difference in a proportion of, of uh, choices. So they um, allocated 75% um, of their choices to the high dose and only 25% to lower dose. And then as you move to the right on the x-axis, the doses get closer together and you can see they are really tuned into the nicotine and uh, always choose it, allocating significantly more choices to smoke um, to the highest, higher dose. And so uh, without question, in terms of self-administration, they are taking the higher dose nicotine cigarette over the reduced nicotine content cigarettes. A standard questionnaire that's used in tobacco um, research is the modified cigarette, uh, cigarette evaluation uh, questionnaire. And I'm showing you results here from the exposure sessions where they rated each of the cigarettes on, and if you look down the leftmost column, the, these are subscales on this questionnaire. And then the, we have a going in a row from left to right, increasing doses of the nicotine content cigarettes. And the if you look at the top um, subscale smoking satisfaction, you see these are, um, these subscales are um, overall means for uh, like smoking satisfaction, three particular questions um, related to satisfaction in which they're um, rating the cigarette on a seven point Likert scale uh, with one being um, don't like it at all and seven um, extremely. And you can see increasing ratings as the nicotine content goes up and the superscript symbols here, um, dose conditions that don't share a symbol differ at, uh, are statistically different even after adjusting for multiple comparisons. So you have this uh, graded dose effect curve where the lowest rating is with the 0.4 milligram dose. Mm -hmm. The two intermediate doses both differ from the low dose, but not from each other. And then both of those doses differ from the highest dose. So 
the the positive control is uh, has a higher smoking satisfaction rating than any of the reduced nicotine content cigarettes, but the the dose that has the lowest abuse liability rating, if you're thinking in terms of smoking satisfaction, is the 0.4 milligram dose. And you get a similar uh, relationship with psychological rewards. So this is these two subscales are tapping into the positive reinforcing effects of smoking, just as the self-administration um, sessions were. Then you look at aversion and enjoyment, respiratory tract sensations. You get some differences, but they're not very graded. It's only between the highest dose and, and the nicotine reduction. So not as sensitive and craving reduction starts to get a little bit more back to picking up reinforcing or rewarding effects of smoking. Now, this is an innovation that I, I included given the nature of the panel and um, it's called the hypothetical cigarette purchase task. There's actually a hypothetical purchase task for other substances as well. And what, what you do with this task is in, at the end of each one of those exposure sessions, we ask the um, participant to imagine that they have an opportunity to um, purchase cigarettes in, across a 24 hour period but they have to smoke all the cigarettes that they purchase and um, they cannot sell them or hoard them. So what you see is, and then the, um, they make these estimates across increasing price per cigarette. And this is on a log scale, but we take it from essentially no cost all the way up to extremely $40 per cigarette. And what you see is you, um, you get this really nice, if you look at the over on the left side, this nice dose dependent gradient. And then as price goes up, eventually demand uh, starts decreasing. These are behavioral economic, it's a behavioral economic task. And you get this really nice demand curve from which you can glean uh, five indices. The first I'm showing here is demand intensity right uh, next to the demand curve. And the um, what you're seeing as dose demand intensity is the amount of cigarettes they estimate, estimate they would smoke if cigarettes were free and you get the lowest rating at the um, at the 0.4 dose, and then it increments up, and the two in, the um, two lowest doses don't differ from each other, but the lowest differs from the two highest doses. And then um, the right top panel is showing the maximum amount of money they estimate they would spend in a 24-hour period on cigarettes as a function of dose. And now you're getting a really nice graded dose effect curve showing that as you decrease the amount of nicotine in the cigarette, they're less willing to allocate money. So it has less reinforcing value. Um, same thing if you look at the price at which smoking uh, starts to move from being inelastic to elastic or sensitive to price, you get a graded response um, curve. And then breakpoint is an outcome that has a lot of intuitive appeal. And that's the, the uh, price at which they said of cigarettes where that price had one smoke. And again, you get this really nice graded dose effect curve showing that the lower you, the, the less the nicotine content, the um, sooner they would um, not smoke rather than pay the price. And then this is a, this last panel bottom right is a, an overall estimate of sensitivity to price, not, not as sensitive to these dose differences. So you get um, a separation between the somewhat uh, of a graphical dis, uh, separation, but it's not statistically significant between the low and the highest. So that measure is not very sensitive, but the others are quite sensitive and this is easy to administer. You just have them smoke a cigarette and tell, ask them to estimate um, how much how much they would purchase of that cigarette in a 24 hour period, and um, at varying prices. And you get this beautiful these beautiful dose effect curves. All right. So now I think I I hope I've shown you um, in an acute 
uh, abuse liability testing arrangement, clinical laboratory arrangement, that nicotine dose matters a lot. So now we're going to move to extended exposure to these uh, cigarettes and we're gonna use the same three populations, but we're gonna do randomized clinical trials. And so the, the uh, number of participants per population uh, increases. And so you can see the numbers here for reproductive age women, uh, those with affective disorders and those with opioid use disorder. Um, and they get randomly assigned. These are all adult daily smokers. They had to smoke at least five cigarettes a day. They get randomly assigned to uh, one of these three doses for four for 12 weeks. Um, the protocols are essentially parallel protocols in each of the populations. And um, they report daily through an IVR system how many cigarettes they smoke uh, that day. Uh, the study cigarettes and any, they're instructed not to use any other products, but we ask them to tell us if they did and they're not punished for doing so. And so we have total cigarettes as well. And then uh, once a week, they come into the lab for an in-person assessment and we uh, do additional uh, tasks and we replenish the research cigarettes for the following week. And the primary outcome is total cigarettes per day. And then we also measure dependent severity biomarkers to validate the self-reported smoking rates. And um, also, again, the cigarette purchase task. So here I'm showing the uh, total cigarettes, the primary outcome. And at baseline, I should have mentioned, um, we're going to give the participants free cigarettes. And so we want to know what, they, uh, what their smoking rate would be. Um, with their usual brand cigarette, if they smoked that, if they had those cigarettes um, for free. And so one week baseline, we have them um, um, just smoke their usual brand cigarettes and we can document there are no group differences in smoking rate going into the study. And we took measures of how they rated their usual brand cigarette. And I'll come back to that uh, a little later in the talk. So then what you see the, down here is the legend showing the different color, uh, the darkest uh, circle for 15.8. And then we're just using two reduced nicotine content cigarettes, the two lowest doses. And um, and by week 12, which is the, the outcome measure, I mean, we're looking at over time as well, but we were hypothesized differences by week 12. And sure enough, you have them where total cigarettes per day smoked is significantly lower in both reduced nicotine content cigarette conditions relative to the, um, to the positive control condition and there are no population differences. Uh, they're all showing that same uh, relationship. And that's also true if you just look at study cigarettes and ignore the other cigarettes that they smoked. Now, um, a measure of nicotine dependent severity, the Fagerstrom is the most validated longstanding uh, test for looking at this. It has six items. One of the items um, asks about cigarettes per day. So we uh, extract that item uh, from the, this analysis. And so it's just the five other items from the Fagerstrom. And you, we, we have the baseline value. And then we're looking at um, the effects at each dose. And the, it did not interact with time. So there's just overall main effects of a cigarette condition. So you have somewhat of a graded dose effect curve, but the two uh, reduced nicotine content cigarettes are not differing from each other and both are differing from the positive control. And um, on the right, we're looking at the same kind of relationship, but using another um, dependence uh, severity measure known as by the acronyms, acronym of the WISDOM um, for measuring uh, dependence severity. And here it interacts with time and the effects are growing um, the dose differences are growing over time. And then by the end of the um, session, end of the 12 week period, you're seeing these dose dependent um, effects where the reduced nicotine content cigarette, especially the lowest dose is significantly producing less dependent severity. And I 
if I didn't mention already, dependent, I should have, dependent severity is one of the strongest predictors of the likelihood of succeeding and quitting if you do make a quit attempt. And most smokers will make, um, about half of all smokers will make a quit att- at least one quit attempt per year. So it's a very important measure. All right, now uh, biochemical verification, breath CO, you're seeing um, that same kind of plot, the breath CO over weeks, and you're getting both um, reduced nicotine content. Cigarettes have a overall effect um, that the collapsing across time, differing from the um, from the positive control, and they also differ at week 12, although the most pronounced difference is with the lowest nicotine content cigarette. And you see that a lot. Sometimes you don't, um, often the two, these two doses are not differing from each other, but they're differing from the positive control. But when only one of them differs, it's uniformly always the lowest dose. That's very important information for the FDA to have, which is that you might be able to get a a reduction if you went with an intermediate dose. But if you want the most reliable reduction, you would go below that 0.7 milligram threshold that was originally hypothesized. Other biomarkers. Now, this first that we're seeing population differences and essentially what's going on is in the affective disorder population and disadvantaged women, the two reduced nicotine content cigarettes are differing from the control um, on urine cotinine, cotinine being a metabolite of nic- how much nicotine are consuming. But in the population with opioid use disorder, you're not seeing that. And the same thing for NNAL levels, which is a measure of a um, carcinogen that's uh, related to tobacco use, both um, oral and smoked. And so what's going on is the opioid use disorder population is substituting a non-combusted source of nicotine um, while they're abstaining from the combusted cigarettes. So combusted cigarettes are the most toxic form of nicotine use. So the information that this sends to the FDA is if you're going to implement a nicotine reduction policy, you want to have non-combusted sources of nicotine available for those who are either unable or unwilling to quit using nicotine. And the, here, this population was choosing smokeless um, tobacco, so it could be you know Swedish Swedish snus, or it could be e-cigarettes or something. But you want to have um, some sort of non-combusted alternatives available in the marketplace. Back to that cigarette purchase task. Um, now, first time I shared the this results from with this task, um, I showed you five indices, but some of those indices are correlated with each other. So over time, the convention has come uh, has come to be to do a factor analysis, and we did that in this study. And what happens is you get two factors, and the one I'm showing up here in the upper left panel is what has come to be referred to as demand amplitude. And it's that item of how much would you smoke if cigarettes were free? And those of you who might like ice cream or something, the idea is say, oh, you really like ice cream? Okay, how much would you eat? If it was free and it was right there, no stigma, just how much, you know, have at it. And so that's what they're doing on cigarettes. And you see, you get very nice differences um, to we. Uh, by week two, at week six, and clearly um, by week 12. And um, yeah, so the demand intensity is reduced by reducing nicotine. I mentioned, or if I should have mentioned it, demand and uh, amplitude or intensity is also correlated with nicotine dependent severity. So very important to the likelihood of succeeding if you attempt to quit smoking. Uh, all the other uh, indices load on to a persistence factor, and that's um, come to be uh, thought of as re- representing uh, sensitivity to price. And remember, that wasn't so sensitive when it was just a single index. And when you combine them, it's not as sensitive as we'd like. And I'll show you that again down the bottom. But it still gives you a, a graded dose effect curve. 
in the upper right-hand panel. You go down. So that's where we're asking them about the study cigarettes. They're doing these ratings on the study cigarettes. Below, we ask them to rate their usual brand cigarettes, even though hopefully they haven't been using them during the 12-week period. And for demand amplitude, you see that um, being exposed to reduced nicotine content cigarettes is also decreasing demand intensity for the usual brand cigarettes. But when you look at sensitivity to price, not so much. So um, I, th I think it's just that this demand intensity or amplitude item happens to be very related to addiction potential and is more sensitive than uh, how... Um, sensitive the individual is to the price of the product. So now I wanted to uh, wrap up with a little bit of information because remember I mentioned that um, to get a, going into ex extended exposure, we knew that we'd be giving them free cigarettes. We wanted to see what their smoking rate was with their usual brand cigarette if they were given free. And that gave us a chance. So we did that and um, we had them do that rating prior to exposure to um, the free, the actual free cigarettes. So the first session we said, oh, you're a smoker, use your brand smoker, you know, complete this, uh, this uh, task asking you how much you would smoke your usual brand cigarette if it was free. Then we ran the one week of giving them free cigarettes. So allows us to compare estimated smoking rate to actually observe smoking rate. And here's what we found, that when they estimate their smoking rate, they overestimate how much they actually would smoke if you gave them the, the product to, to, to smoke. And it almost reminds me of that old adage that the eyes are bigger than the belly. They think, oh, free cigarettes, I would just smoke, you know, I don't know, they're estimating 22 cigarettes a day, but it ends up it's more around 17 or 18. I think they just um, underestimate satiation. Um, but then the, the scientific question is, well, which is sensitive? Are they both sensitive to important questions about tobacco? And so what we did was just, there are some real well-known, well-established differences, like men usually smoke more than women. Um, more Well, I'll show you the results, but we wanted to see What's the relative sensitivity to these important differentiators of uh, different types of smokers? So we're looking at smoking rate here, and I start at the top, gender, and on the left, the two bars are estimated, and then on the right, what we actually observe, and you get significant gender differences when you look at the estimated rates and when you look at the observed rates. And they're very similar. It's just that the observed are a little uniformly reduced compared to the um, estimated. But the uh, sensitivity to these differences, first one, gender, second one, comparing people who have opioid use disorder versus people who do not. And in both, when you're going by estimated versus observed, both uh, are sensitive to that difference. Um, older smokers typically smoke at a higher rate than younger smokers. When you're doing uh, estimated, you get a nice graded dose effect curve or age effect curve. And when you do the observed, you get the same effect curve. It's just uh, down, shifted downward somewhat. And same thing with the educational attainment. People who have less education typically smoke uh, at a higher rate. And you can see that with, with the um, estimated and with the observed smoking. So to wrap up, I think we're very fortunate to have a rich battery of assessment methods for examining the abuse liability of psychoactive substances in humans. Um, I think we've presented you with overwhelming evidence across a wide range of measures that reducing nicotine content in cigarettes significantly reduces the, the abuse liability of smoking. And in terms of potential impacts on regulation, um, the uh, reduced nicotine content cigarettes uh, that were uh, developed by 20th Century Group, they received a modified uh, re uh, modified risk tobacco product designation, the first product to receive that designation by FDA, and they now are marketing 
uh, two cigarettes, reduced nicotine content cigarettes in a couple markets in uh, Chicago, uh, Denver, and, and Illinois more generally, and uh, Colorado more generally. And uh, they're trying to market to smokers who are interested in quitting with the idea that if they were using these cigarettes, they would have lower dependence and severity, be smoking at a lower rate, have a lot higher likelihood of quitting if they choose to do so. Um, so the turning back to this third bullet, then these methods are highly sensitive to differences in nicotine cigarettes, nicotine content cigarettes under both acute and chronic exposure, rigorous double blind testing. Um, I think they provide FDA with a rich body of information relevant to the regulatory policy. The purchase task was included to represent newer, more time efficient and uh, of course, cost-efficient tools for uh, are they're becoming available um, and are should be included. But I think for now, and you saw my my um, preference, I'm not going to use only those measures until we have a, a longer history with them. But I think um, using a battery of established and innovative methods is probably the most prudent strategy currently in tobacco regulatory uh, research. So thank you, and I'll stop there. Great, thank you so much for that presentation, Dr. Higgins. And uh, I'll stop my share. Thanks so much, Dr. Higgins. Uh, do we have uh, Lieutenant Martin Kimani, is he online? Uh, we don't see him yet, so I've okay. sent him an email. So please, uh, yeah, go to the next presentations, then, then sure. by then we got, he's gonna join. All right, next we'll have Dr. Heather Kimmel, who is a health science Scientist Administrator, Project Officer, and Director of the Population Assessment of Tobacco and Health Study at NIH. Please go ahead, Dr. Kim. Thank you very much for having me here today. And thank you so much for that great introduction and for Dr. Higgins' wonderful presentation. I'm gonna follow this, his clinical presentation up with an epidemiology study. So um, it's a wonderful opportunity to talk to you about some work that my colleague and I from NIDA published uh, recently on the association of blind and non-blind cannabis use with cigarette, e-cigarette and cigar initiation. And I would like to point out that the lead author and analyst for this study, Brian Hammer, was at NIDA at the time of, his, of this work, but he is now at the Guzman College for Public Health at the University of Arkansas for Medical Sciences. What well, Dr. Conte reports stockholding from several companies unrelated to the study, the other authors, including myself, have no concept to report. And these analyses use data from the past study, which is supported by federal funds from both NIDA and the Center for Tobacco Products at FDA. It's just wonderful to be here and talking to my FDA collaborators today. Okay. So as a brief reminder, a blind is a guy that has had the tobacco removed and replaced with marijuana. Despite removing the tobacco, the blind still contain some nicotine, although not at the level of cigarette. However, blind use does result in carbonate levels similar to healthy secondhand cigarette exposure, which is a cause for concern. Another cause for concern is that NOTA data from 2021 show that more youth aged 12 to 17 years old smoked blind than smoked similar in the past 30 days. The same studies show that almost 10% of young adults aged 18 to 25 also use blunt. So this youth and young adult use of blunt has been shown to increase the risk of developing nicotine dependence and to progress to cigar or other combustible tobacco use. So the research question that we addressed in these analyses are whether smoking blunt in the past year increased the risk of using other tobacco products, specifically cigarettes, use cigarettes, and cigars across all age work. As I mentioned earlier, the past study is a collaboration between NIDA and the FDA Center for Tobacco Products. And this is a nationally representative longitudinal cohort study at the US civilian non institutionalized population aged 12 years and older. The analogy that I'm going to be talking about today focused on 
was founded that had never used cigarettes, e-cigarettes, or cigars at the time of the first wave, a wave one of data collection. And this data collection was administered from September 2013 through December of 2014. And overall, you can see that across our 45,000 plus participants, just over a third, a 38 percent had never used cigarettes. And while over three quarters, or about 83 percent had never used e-cigarettes. And likewise, about two thirds or 63 percent had never used cigarettes at the time of wave one. As I noted before, our come of interest was the time to first use of cigarettes, e-cigarettes, and any cigar, as well as any combustible tobacco, in this case, cigarettes or cigars, or any of the three products. Our three social groups were past year use of blank, non-blank cannabis or neither product. And in these studies, we used a discrete time survival analysis to model the probability of the outcome of interest occurring over the effective time interval. And we also examined the impacts of both time invariant and time varying covariance on these probabilities. So in this figure, we are looking at the cumulative percentage of past study participants who initiated use of cigarettes in the left panel e-cigarette in the middle panel and any cigar in the right panel. The time points wave two, three, and four. And I want to point out that wave four was collected from, from October of 2016 through January of 2018. So this is a three-year time interval. And so these time points are across the x-axis. And then we have the percentages shown at the y-axis. So the three lines represent the past year use of blunt with a solid line. Whoops, let me go back. Um, the past year use of blunt in the solid line, the past year use of non blunt cannabis by the dashed line, and then past year use of another product in the, in the dotted line. So, from this figure, we can see about half the people using blunt in the path near the top line initiated one of these three tobacco products by wave four. Meanwhile, people using non blunt cannabis use, this middle line, um, started these products at a more modest rate. And those who use neither blunt nor non-blunt cannabis at baseline initiate these tobacco products at the lowest rate. But the takeaway message from this figure is that higher tobacco products initiation is related to past year blunt use and to a lesser extent non-blunt cannabis use. So our regression analyses of this particular set of data confirmed a a positive overall association between past year blunt news and tobacco initiation, even after accounting for multiple possible confounders, including sex, age, past month use of tobacco, alcohol, or any drug, drug as well as mental health measures. In the right hand column, we see that even when controlling for past month cigarette use, or traditional cigars, cigarilla, and those with a cigar use, we still see seven significant differences between those that use blunt in the past year and those that use non blunt cannabis in the past year. In addition, if you look at the last row here, we see that the past year blunt use is more strongly associated with starting to smoke any cigar than with initiating cigarettes or e cigarettes. So these figures, like the one I showed earlier with the range of data collection along the x-axis and percent initiated along the y-axis. However, this focuses on the initiation of three cigar types. The left panel shows traditional cigars, the center panel, the gorilla, and the last panel, the right-hand panel, goes to the cigars. And so once again, we're showing this by um, use, past year use of line from the solid line, non-blank cannabis, with the, with the dashed line and neither the dotted line. And so what we saw here was that those who used blunt in the past year initiated all three of these of cigar products, traditional cigars, traditional cigarillos, and filter cigars at a higher rate than those using non-blunt cannabis or neither of these products. However, if you look at the middle figure here, the cigarella, these findings often indicate the passion of blunt smoking may be significantly related to beginning to smoke cigarellas. 
So a regression that confirmed a strong, strong association between past year blunt smoking and cigarette initiation. The people smoking blunt were more likely to begin smoking cigarettes than people using non-blunt cannabis or neither product. And in contrast, the blunt and non-blunt cannabis use was only modestly associated with the initiation of use of traditional cigars or filtered cigars. And so these results suggest that the initiation between blunt use and initiating any cigars may be primarily driven by the initiation of cigarella in this group. So we next estimated the association between past year blunt use and furnishing use combustible tobacco, again, defining the study as cigarettes or cigars, or any tobacco, which would be any of the three products that we have studied. So almost two-thirds of the people using blunt in the past year initiated the use of the combustible tobacco product, where about three-quarters initiated any use of any tobacco product, which are staggering numbers to me. And comparatively, as you've seen in the other analyses that I showed you, we see lower rates of initiation for the non blunt cannabis use in the past year or using neither of these products in the past year. So again, a regression analysis collaborated these findings such that past year blunt smoking significantly elevated the odds of initiating any combustible tobacco product, but also increased the odds of initiating any tobacco product relative to the modest association with using non-blunt cannabis or neither of these products. So in brief, we saw that using blunt was associated with the increased likelihood of initiating cigarettes, use cigarettes, or cigars. And this association was higher than with those, than those people who use non-blind cannabis. And within the cigar product category, the use of blind increased the risk of initiating cigarettes more than initiating traditional cigars or filtered cigars. Now, I do want to point out that one limitation of the study is that the past year measure of blind use is relatively crude. And the past study did not provide granular detail about the other forms of tobacco and cannabis co-use. And to wrap up, I would like to thank the um, other members of the NIDA Path Study team who supported this work. And these folks included Dr. Marsha, Dr. Sylvia, Dr. Everard, and Dr. Kramer, as well as Ms. Washington. Thank you so much for your time today. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Kimmel. Uh, Lieutenant Kamani, do we have you on now? Yes. Great. Can you hear? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Uh, did Did you have your slides to share, or do we have? Um... Sure, I'm about to share them. Great. Okay. So thank you. Next, we'll have a presentation from Lieutenant Martin Kimani, who is a senior regulatory research officer at the FDA's Forensic Chemistry Center. Go ahead, Dr. Kimani. Can you see the slides? Yes, we can, if you just want to put it in presentation mode. Okay. Sorry. Um... Yeah, please go on the toolbar in the top. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, hello, everyone, and good morning uh, from Guam. My name is uh, Martin Kimani, and today I'll be talking about the work that FDA is doing ensuring that FDA regulated products uh, <clears throat> are safe, uh, that important for international males are safe for use by uh, consumers. Specifically, I'll be talking about our efforts, uh, the chemists and biologists that are located at the port of entry, where we use portable devices uh, to analyze products uh, in a rapid way. I'd like to acknowledge uh, the authors that were involved in this work, most of them are situated at the Forensic Chemistry Center in Cincinnati, Ohio, and other Office of Reg Regulatory Affairs labs uh, throughout the U.S. Also, all the views and uh, opinions expressed throughout this presentation, those of the presenter, and do not really represent the official position of uh, US FDA. 
There are about eight IMF uh, locations throughout the country, um, located at the Los Angeles, California, in Honolulu, Chicago, uh, St. Thomas, uh, Virgin Islands. And uh, in these locations, FDA investigators uh, look at products and ensure that uh, thorough examination is conducted to ensure that products that are FDA regulated that reach the consumers in a safe way. Uh, the operations at, the, at these mail facilities, it's a joint operation uh, between other federal agencies, such as the U.S. Postal Service that delivers all international mail to the Customs and Border Patrol. Uh, the Customs and Border Protection protect, uh, conducts the initial screening, and if there are any FDA regulated products, they are referred to FDA, and the FDA regulates any pharmaceutical devices and biologics. We also uh, have interaction with other partner government agencies, such as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, the Department of Agriculture, uh, the U.S. Uh, enforcement uh, Drug Enforcement Agencies for uh, Controlled Products, and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, in a snapshot, uh, tons of products pass through the international mail. Uh, about 729 million pieces uh, were processed in uh, 2020, and reports have indicated that uh, these international mail facilities are routes for illicit drugs that come, uh, an another unapproved drugs that come to the US. These illicit drugs are commonly uh, transported in powder form or can be pressed into counter uh, counterfeit pills that are falsely marketed as authentic products. In 2019, a small percentage of these products that uh, come through the mail were uh, examined. And out of those, 85% of those uh, were screened by FDA were found not were found, were found to be violated and refused entry uh, in the US. Our goal is to increase resources and expand the amount of products that are being uh, inspected every year from about 15,000 pieces to about 100,000 uh, per year. To do that, we are setting up these satellite laboratories, which will be located throughout uh, the US. At the moment, we have one that's been uh, operating for the past year that's located in Chicago, Illinois. This just here gives you a timeline of uh, uh, the satellite laboratory operation. In 2017, at the request of the Associate Commissioner of Reg Regulatory Affairs, for the Chemistry Center was requested to give a, a draft proposal on how we can uh, increase the package inspections from about 15,000 per year to about 100,000 per year. Uh, in 2018, August 2018, uh, there was a joint operation between the Office of Criminal Investigations, uh, consumer safety officers from Office of Import Operations, and also chemists from the Forensic Chemistry Center and other uh, Office of Regulatory Affairs uh, Laboratories where we conducted an operation to understand what type of products come through the mail. Uh, in 2020, uh, I, uh, in 2020, a final a pilot program, a summary was submitted to senior management, which supported uh, transitioning uh, the, the pilot operation to a fully established uh, lab. And the lab was fully, uh, went to full production mode uh, in 2021. So our lab at these locations uses a two-pronged approach where we are looking at counterfeit analysis of drugs. And to do this, we're trying to determine if suspect tablets or capsules are consistent with those uh, of the authentic products. And in this case, we work a lot with the US pharmaceutical companies where we get authentic products and we create libraries which we can always uh, uh, reference on those suspect tablets we see at international mail facilities. Additionally, we are interested in analysis of unknown products that are seen at these facilities. And uh, we use uh, three uh, different instruments. All these are portable devices that can be taken into the field. And uh, we also use them because there's limited space at, at these uh, international mail facilities. One, we use a portable FTIR, which is a Fourier transform infrared spectrometer. We also have a Raman spectrometer and a 
direct analysis real time uh, mass spectrometer. And what you're trying to do is try and identify any active pharmaceutical ingredients in these suspect products or capsules. Uh, this is what we call a counterfeit device five. This was made, uh, produced at Forensic Chemistry Center in Cincinnati. And here's an example of a, a suspect product versus an authentic product. And we're pretty much using a fluorescence uh, type technology where we are il uh, illuminating different wavelength of light and uh, different filters uh, at different products, uh, at these uh, uh, on, a, on a authentic product. And we compare that to a suspect product. If these products are the same, the color, uh, they should visually look the same. And this is an example where uh, these products are quite different. We are continually increasing our dosage libraries where you have about 92 therapeutic products, 26 opioid products, and 50, 56 lifestyle products for a total of 174. And we are continually increasing our library entries in this device. To give you an idea of uh, the number of products that have been examined at the international facilities, we had about uh, 531 submissions um, that total lot units, this, uh, this indicates the number of capsules or individual tablets that were in these submissions were about 472,000. Uh, the unique number of brands that were reviewed about 28 and the ones that were found to be counterfeit were about 20, 78 or 80% of those uh, examined. Additionally, we've been looking at uh, the unknown products. By definition, they are known. These are products which don't have any labeling to them. Uh, in the one year since uh, full production mode, that was from June, 20, June 2021 to June 2022, about 964 products were examined. Uh, uh, almost 80% were found to contain drugs. And at least two of these devices were able to identify the same API. Almost 230, 213 unique APIs have been identified so far. Uh, these include, uh, some of them were unscheduled. We had uh, uh, scheduled uh, drugs. Some of them are improved and also 801 new type drugs. And these are a subset of API that FDA has determined to pose a significant, a significant health concern. So we kind of authorize uh, for destruction. This just, uh, it's only a subset of the type of APIs that we've seen uh, at the international web facilities, uh, ranging from uh, your therapeutic type drugs, which are already on the it a new uh, list to uh, some designer benzodiazepines, which are unapproved uh, in the US, to also schedule drugs, which uh, uh, some of them are potentially as dangerous as, as fentanyl. And in this case, we are talking about these new nitazine type drugs, such as isotonitazine and these n paradino etonitazine drugs. We are continually looking to evaluate new technologies. And as, as I said uh, before, the space at the IMF labs is really limited. So we, we've we been looking at these portable devices. In this case, just to ensure that we don't, we don't get a lot of false positives, we are looking at these portable GCMS and uh, some other uh, portable devices just to complement everything that we have uh, uh, at the mail facilities. We're also looking at uh, these handheld Raman devices in particular, we have these, uh, it's a specially offset Raman device that's able to scan through um, some cardboards or through some opaque or thicker materials. And that gives an added uh, protection to the analysts who are situated at the laboratories. With that, uh, I'll close and uh, uh, thank you for your attention and I'm uh, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, we'll actually have, uh, if you have questions, please, Put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, and we'll address those afterwards. But thank you so much for that interesting presentation, Lieutenant Kimani. Uh, Dr. Sarah Eggers will be presenting next. She directs the decision support and analysis staff with an FDA Center for Drug Evaluation and Research. Go ahead, Dr. Eggers. Thank you very much. Do you see my screen the way it should, or do you see the notes? 
Looks good. Looks good. Great. On behalf of my FDA team, I'm happy to share our work to leverage systems modeling to inform policies on opioids. This work is the result of an FDA cooperative agreement with a team led by MJ Jalali at Harvard University, Massachusetts General Health, I'll refer to today as the Harvard team. The statements I present are mine and should not be attributed to FDA. The opioid crisis is among the most significant public health challenges of this century. Making meaningful gains on this crisis requires multiple interventions that work together to decrease unnecessary exposure and non-medical use of prescription opioids, to mitigate the harms from overdose, and to support individuals who have opioid use disorder, or OUD, among other things. Assessing the potential effects of such interven interventions is extremely challenging in light of the complex and ever-changing opioids landscapes. Systems modeling can bring novel insights to just this type of challenging assessment. It adds value by emphasizing the integrated nature of complex social phenomena, by accounting for changing dynamics over time, by bringing together different sources of information, and by enabling the exploration of multiple possibilities of the future. In 2018, our team began an opioid modeling effort following recommendations from the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. The goals are to help identify strategies that may have the greatest positive effect on the crisis and to assess the potential for unintended consequences of actions. Another goal is to identify areas where further research is needed to address key uncertainties about the system. The flagship deliverable of this effort is SOURCE, Simulation of Opioid Use, Response, Consequences, and Effects. SOURCE is a national level dynamic systems simulation model calibrated to 22 years of historical data from multiple sources. It captures the historical dynamics of the crisis within its defined scope. It can also project potential future trajectories of the crisis for use in policy analysis. Sources described in detail in the publication shown on the left. I'm going to very briefly walk through a few highlights of source and its first analyses. This is a simplified version of the model structure. Source tracks the movement of the US opioid using population ages 12 and higher through different states, starting with on the left, misuse of prescription opioids or heroin through the development of OUD and as applicable into and out of treatment with medications for OUD and or OUD remission. The model incorporates dynamic phenomena called feedback loops, such as perceived risk, Source also tracks opioid overdose mortality and related public health outcomes through its states. As I will say several times, I'm glossing over many details, so please see Lim et al. 2022 paper for more detail. The first analysis I want to highlight is what we call baseline trajectories of the crisis. That is plausible future trends and key outcomes of the crisis over time, assuming no specific change to current policy. These baselines are important because they provide a comparator to assess how future policies could change that trajectory. I want to be clear, however, that while insightful, these projections should not be considered precise forecasts. The baselines are generated based on the model's calibration of the historical trends and making assumptions about the future trends in the mo model's exogenous inputs. For example, how the rate of opioid prescribing changes over time or the rate of the penetration penetration of illicit manufactured fentanyl in the heroin supply. We can change these assumptions to test different possibilities of the future. For our analysis, we simulated three different scenarios. These graphs show the baseline projections for a number of key public health outcomes over time, from 2020, where the red line is, dashed line is, over to um, the future in 2020, 2032. The outcomes from left to right include misuse initiation, prevalence of use disorder, and over overdose death. The outcomes are split considering the top outcomes for people who primarily use prescription opioids, and at the bottom outcomes among people whose use is primarily associated with heroin. Note that source includes the effects of illicit fentanyl contamination of heroin when tracking over opioid overdose death. Projections for all three scenarios, again reflecting three different sets of assumptions, are included and the shaded areas around, areas around the lines reflect model uncertainty. I highly recommend seeing the paper for details and discussion. The second thing to highlight is how source can also generate insights into the unexpected. 
More than 69,000 opioid overdose deaths were reported in 2020, the first year of COVID. This is 24% more deaths than what source had predict, projected um, occurring based on pre-COVID trends. The Harvard team used source to, I, to explore the bigger than expected rise in death and what may be accounted for this change. For example, changes related to the use of, of medications for OUD. They did so by comparing the original source baseline projections, which had extrapolated the historical trends, against projections that use the actual trends for 2020 for which data were available. These are the results of that. The continued rise of illicit fentanyl present in the heroin supply was the largest identified contributor to the excess deaths. Unexplained deaths were ones that could not be accounted for but with any um, within sources structure and could be at least in part accounted for by nuanced effects of COVID such as social isolation. There's a silver lining, a few trends contributed to a potential lives saved in 2020, for example, a greater rise in buprenorphine treatment. Again, I've glossed over many details. Please see Stringfellow at all 2023. Finally, I wanna highlight how systems model can explore uh, how new policies could lead to positive changes to the crisis. In the first published policy analysis, source was used to compare the future impacts of achieving 11 broad hypothetical strategy goals in areas such as opioid misuse initiation, overdose harm reduction, capacity to provide buprenorphine treatment, and recovery supports for people in remission. To test each strategy, we improved its parameter by 20% and then assumed a three-year ramp-up period. We then compared its projected impact impacts with this 20% improvement uh, relative to the baseline. Here are a few outputs of that analysis. Shown in the graph on the left, source projects that among the 11 strategies, the largest and fastest incremental impacts on reducing opioid overdose deaths over the next 10 years will come from reducing the likelihood that the overdose, of an overdose from fentanyl. For example, if there are interventions that can enable people to detect the presence of illicitly manufactured fentanyl and a drug that adjust their use behavior accordingly. Increased naloxone distribution to people who misuse prescription or illicit opioids was second. It's important to point out that both strategies would re result in a slight uptick in the prevalence of OUD while they are reducing overdose deaths. But reducing prevalence of OUD is also important. Strategies that help people who are in remission stay in remission came out on top among the 11 strategies on achieving the greatest reduction in the prevalence of, of opioid use disorder, while it's still achieving one of the largest reductions in overdose deaths in the long term. Again, I've glossed over many details, so please see Stringfellow at all 2022 for this. Source has been designed for use within a policy analysis tool tailored to fit regulatory decision needs as part of a toolbox of resources. We've also begun tapping into qualitative systems modeling approaches to aid discussion on complex opioid topics. We cr clearly recognize that source reflects a complex and rapidly evolving crisis. Therefore, it necessarily relies on incomplete and time lag data, and it has important limitations in scope. It does not account for counterfeit pharmaceuticals or fentanyl contamin contamination of stimulants. These are both growing concerns. It does not account for polysubstance use or the effects of undertreated pain. And as a national level model, it does not it, source aggregates across geographic and demographic subgroups. Therefore, nuanced insights regarding potential impacts specific to one region, for example, is beyond the scope of source. Our FDA termed team has learned so much from this effort regarding the complexity of the crisis, the value of systems modeling, and really what it takes to develop a systems modeling that can meet the needs of a regulatory agency. We have more work ahead. We continue to lead efforts to address data gaps and further enhance source, to conduct complementary research and modeling efforts, and to implement systems modeling as a tool that can support policy analysis. The success of this effort has depended on close partnership with our Harvard research team and a cadre of experts internal and external to FDA. You can find more information on our project, including the papers I discussed on our website. I will end here with the work cited. 
and I thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Dr. Eggers. Next, we'll have Dr. Rose Braden, who is a team lead in the Division of Epidemiology within the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research's uh, Office of Surveillance and Epidemiology. Go ahead, Dr. Raiden. Thanks. All right. Can you see the um, the slide in um, in presenter view or in slideshow view? We're not not getting your slides yet. Okay. Can you see it now? Yep, there we go, perfect. Wonderful. All right, um, some of the other um, speakers, such as um, Dr. Sokolovska and Dr. Eggers have mentioned the FDA overdose prevention framework. And this also uh, informs our work on prescription stimulants. Um, so since um, this has been mentioned earlier, I will just go over this quickly, is that the, the vision is to undertake and support impactful creative actions to prevent drug overdoses and reduce deaths. The goal of the overdose prevention framework is to strike a balance between promoting appropriate treatment and preventing the consequences of non-medical use of prescription stimulants. And FDA recognizes that prescription stimulants are an important treatment option for conditions, including attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, or ADHD, and narcolepsy. They also have a high potential for abuse and as such are federally controlled Schedule II drugs with diversion and non-medical use evident. So that's why it's important to eliminate unnecessary initial prescription drug exposure and inappropriate prolonged prescribing. So some examples of FDA initiatives related to prescription stimulants for the primary prevention is that to address continuing concerns of misuse, abuse, addiction, and significant sharing of prescription stimulants with those for whom they are not prescribed. FDA is requiring updates to the boxed warning and other information to ensure the prescribing information is made consistent across the entire class of these medicines. Also harm reduction, expanding availability and access to naloxone to address co-use of prescription stimulants and opioids, which as you'll see in my talk is an important source of harm. As well as um, ensuring a safe drug supply, address counterfeit stimulants or stimulants spiked with fentanyl by taking compliance actions and partnering with DEA for joint actions against those selling products illegally online. Now that I gave the context, I'll present on the epidemiology of prescription stimulant diversion and non-medical use, starting with time trends in medical and non-medical use. And when I say non-medical use, that encompasses intentional use not as directed for a desired physiologic effect. For example, to increase concentration, to stay awake or to get high. Non-medical use is most common among young adults and will examine common motivations, perceptions, and behaviors um, in that age group. Then moving on to harms from non-medical use of prescription versus illicit stimulants, as well as growing concerns about illicit sellers offering fake stimulant products. To provide the context for the utilization of prescription stimulants, this figure compares the estimated number of Schedule II stimulant prescriptions to Schedule II opioid analgesic prescriptions dispensed from U.S. outpatient pharmacies. From 2010 to 2021, stimulant prescribing increased by 71%, while opioid analgesic prescribing dropped by 51%. In 2021, 
Outpatient pharmacies dispensed approximately 73 million Schedule II stimulant prescriptions compared to 100 million Schedule II opioid analgesic prescriptions. This figure shows prescriptions for Schedule II stimulants dispensed from 2010 to 2021 by age. Breaking it out by age group makes apparent that the notable increase in Schedule II stimulant prescribing over the last decade was driven by an increase in prescriptions to patients 17 years and older, as shown in red. Prescriptions dispensed to patients ages 16 years or younger remained relatively steady over time. Among the general US population, there isn't a lot of evidence of increasing non-medical use of prescription stimulants, coinciding with the observed increase in stimulant prescribing. According to the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, Past year prescription stimulant non-medical use, shown by the dark blue line, was fairly stable from 2015 through 2019. There was a trend break in 2020 and 2021 due to methodological changes, including pandemic-related changes. And so, while we cannot directly compare these years, there does not seem to be an increase at that time relative to prior years. And then in comparison, we see opioid analgesic non-medical use shown by the orange line increased during the study period and remained greater than past year non-medical use of prescription stimulants. This figure shows the prevalence of past year non-medical use of prescription stimulants, the dashed line, and prescription pain relievers, the dotted line, by age group in the US in 2020. So while the last slide showed overall non-medical use of prescription pain relievers was higher than non-medical use of prescription stimulants, the age-specific estimates for age groups in early adolescence through the early 30s, as you can see marked on the x-axis, follow a similar pattern and estimated values are similar until the mid 30s. Then prescription stimulant, well, non-medical use, while, while it peaks among people ages 21 to 25, um, it drops off in ages 35 years and older. While prescription pain reliever non-medical use does not decline to the same extent with increasing age. Motivations and behaviors around non-medical use of prescription stimulants in young adults have implications for understanding health effects and also might help us understand that difference in the age-specific non-medical use that I just showed on the last slide. So young adults who non-medically use prescription stimulants most commonly report their motivation is to improve school or work performance. This non-medical use tends to be intermittent and infrequent, typically less than once per month. Use of other drugs is common, and other drug use often precedes initiation of prescription stimulant non-medical use. Illicit drug use is common prior to non-medical use of prescription stimulants. FDA is working to understand how substance use affects and is affected by prescription stimulant non-medical use. Noting that these data mostly come from cross-sectional surveys, such as these two recent studies from the public health literature. There are limited data on trajectories of stimulant non-medical use from studies that follow up respondents over time, and FDA is encouraging research to fill that gap because that's important to informing primary prevention harm reduction, and other actions to mitigate harms from prescription stimulant non-medical use. Regardless of the study population, the majority of prescription stimulants used non-medically are obtained through diversion, most often from a friend or relative, 
as shown by the bar on the left. And this proportion is higher than for prescription pain relievers as shown by the bar on the right. The majority of people who use diverted prescription stimulants non-medically acquire them for free. People who non-medically use diverted prescription stimulants report this little stigma associated with getting prescription stimulants for free compared to buying diverted prescription stimulants, as receiving them for free gave the impression of receiving a gift of a legal medication. Among college students with prescriptions, it's relatively common to report that they're asked to divert their medication. And many college students believe obtaining prescription stimulants for non-medical use on campus is easy. I'll now move on to the harms of prescription stimulant and illicit stimulant non-medical use. These are poison center data showing annual numbers of cases involving all Schedule II stimulants rose from 2001 to 2018, as shown by the red line at the top. All C2 or Schedule II stimulants includes prescription stimulants and illicit stimulants, such as cocaine, methamphetamine, and non-pharmaceutical amphetamine. This overall increase has really been driven by the increase in methamphetamine, illicit methamphetamine, shown by the purple line. In contrast, cases of prescription stimulant non-medical use declined from 2011 through 2018, as shown by the orange dashed line. While not shown on this slide, serious, uh, serious adverse events observed in cases of non-medical use of prescription stimulants included dangerous increases in heart rate or blood pressure or new manic or psychotic symptoms. One big public health concern is the rising number of deaths involving psychostimulants. This analysis of the National Vital Statistics System shows stimulant overdose deaths, the solid blue line. And here, stimulant overdose deaths include cases involving illicit or prescription stimulants. Most of them are polysubstance overdoses involving opioids. So to prevent stimulant overdose deaths, it is key to address and mitigate both opioid and stimulant non-medical use. This figure is from a study by Black et al. that analyzed death certificate literal text data to identify the specific stimulant involved in the death. They found that stimulant-involved deaths much more commonly involved cocaine or methamphetamine rather than prescription stimulants. We are also aware that fake fentanyl-laced pills sold online make it riskier to take stimulants obtained from someone else. This phenomenon is complicating our prevention efforts, illustrated by the divergent trends among adolescents. While prescription opioid non-medical use has declined in the last decade among 12th graders, as shown in the lower far right figure from Monitoring the Future, law enforcement has reported increases in seizures of fake fentanyl laced pills that look like prescription opioids, benzodiazepines, or stimulants, and fatal drug overdoses involving illicit fentanyl and other synthetic opioids increased dramatically among adolescents, as shown in the figure on the lower left from Friedman et al. So in summary, Prescription stimulant non-medical use has been stable in recent years while prescribing has increased. Prescription stimulant non-medical use is highest among young adults. Teenagers and young adults who non-medically use prescription stimulants tend to get them from a friend or relative and to believe this behavior is not risky. However, taking a prescription stimulant that is not prescribed to you is diversion and is potentially presenting serious health risks, 
because if it is not from a prescription dispensed to you from a licensed U.S. pharmacy, you cannot be sure what is in the product. Of great concern, fentanyl and methamphetamine are increasingly found in falsified stimulant products that illicit sellers offer online. So our message to the public is, avoid taking prescription stimulants that were not prescribed to you. If you do, have other people there and naloxone on hand in case of contamination. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Radin. Next, we'll have Dr. Walker, who is a social scientist in the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research's Office of Communications, Research, and Risk Communications. Go ahead, Dr. Walker. Thank you, Harriet, uh, and thank you, everyone, all the great presenters that we've had so far in this panel. Uh, is Can everyone see my slides? No, not, not yet. There oh, we go. Yeah. Yep. Great, great. Uh, okay, so prior to getting started, I, I would just like to, first of all, acknowledge my colleagues, Jill Settle and Paula Rausch, who uh, both contributed greatly to the work that I will be presenting today. Um, as part of our public health, health mission to decrease opioid abuse and addiction, we endeavor to understand prescribing practices for medications for opioid use disorders, or MOUDs. Uh, we know that barriers exist to healthcare providers for prescribing MOUDs, and in order to better understand these issues, a data from focus groups was analyzed in order to understand prescribers' experiences, practices, and their perspectives about MOUDs, uh, specifically about the drug buprenorphine. So we've already had a, a great background on the opioid ep epidemic, particularly from the uh, previous two presenters, Dr. Eggers and, and Raiden. Um, so I will move through these bullets for the sake of time and just say that with the steady rise of, of the opioid overuse uh, overdose deaths and, and the significant increase that took place, particularly in 2020, medications for opioid use disorder, MOUDs, such as buprenorphine, uh, methadone, extended release naltroxone, uh, are effective treatments that can reduce overdose mortality. However, these medications, these MOUDs, still remain out of reach for the majority of people with opioid use disorder. Uh, buprenorphine uh, is a uh, partial opioid agonist. Um, it is a uh, safe and effective uh, MOUD when taken as prescribed. It can relieve withdrawal symptoms. It decreases cravings uh, and, and generally lowers the potential for opioid misuse. Um, buprenorphine for OUD comes in a variety of formulations and is often combined with naloxone, uh, many of with many of the formulations and combinations are listed there on the slide. So the data analyzed for the current study were, were collected as part of a qualitative research project conducted uh, by Cedar Ocom in November and December of 2021 and in May of 2022. Uh, during that collection, 16 focus groups were conducted with uh, 141 healthcare providers. Uh, they included uh, primary care physicians, physician specialists, specialists uh, such as psychiatrists, physicians assistants, uh, and, and nurse practitioners. Uh, the groups were separated uh, into two cohorts, um, those who prescribed MOUD and those who had not prescribed uh, MOUDs. Um, the study was a sub-analysis, as I mentioned, of a previously collected data. Uh, so what we looked at was and we analyzed responses to a particular question from the transcripts. Uh, question four, sub-question E, uh, and the question in the transcript was, the current administration released new practice guidelines that exempt many prescribers from federally federal certification requirements, including training, that are part of the process for obtaining a waiver to treat up to 30 patients with buprenorphine for opioid use disorder. Given this exemption, would you consider prescribing buprenorphine if you had patients with OUD? So from the analysis of that sub-question, uh, three main themes emerged um, and sub-themes were identified under each 
umbrella theme. Um, so lack of confidence was one of the main themes, basically lack of confidence in the prescriber's knowledge or their process for prescribing buprenorphine, uh, inconveniences surrounding prescribing buprenorphine, and outcomes, uh, the negative outcomes specifically uh, surrounding buprenorphine prescribing either to themselves, uh, to their practice, or to their patients. So just looking at the first uh, theme, lack of confidence, this theme was characterized by an uncertainty about how the waiver process worked, uh, including the 30 patient exemption, um, a preference to refer patients to specialists, uh, such as pain addiction specialists, and a general feeling of lack of experience or knowledge with buprenorphine, uh, and then OUD requiring a comprehensive multidisciplinary approach, uh, offering meaning offering both physical and mental and emotional treatment for opioid use disorder. Um, oh, this. Oh, this has to populate. Sorry, I'll do this. So these are quotes uh, surrounding each sub theme. Um, and really, for the sake of time, I'll just read the one referring to specialists. Um, so uh, the preference to refer to specialists, the quote is, I'm a pain specialist. I try not to do addiction if I don't have to. So I consider that that is not part of my practice. So I refer them out, meaning uh, patients with OUD, to the psychiatrist, and that's the quote. Um, the next theme was inconvenience. And uh, this uh, theme is characterized by a perception of a lack of resources required to prescribe buprenorphine. Um, resources are in, in short supply, uh, including both personal time and that of staff and human resources. Um, there is also a uh, expressed de, de, uh, Resentment towards this, this attracting uh, this patient population. So often described as an undesirable patient or an undesirable patient population. And then uh, the long-term commitment that is required to provide continued care to these patients. So again, um, oh, I will uh, just read uh, about the long-term commitment at the bottom, the quote. Uh, I might consider maybe short term, one week or two weeks until they see somebody, but I am not willing to take the responsibility on the long term at all. Uh, and then the uh, outcomes uh, theme was characterized by the need for intense follow up or a perceived need for intense follow up, as many providers felt that they did not have the ability to provide repeated visits and tracing or tracking patients. Um, there was concern about side effects, including the intense uh, withdrawal that is experienced by patients, uh, it is particularly uh, at induction, um, and uh, the personal liability, uh, which includes oversight from the DEA or their state medical board, uh, and then lack of re reimbursement, uh, particularly stemming from uncertainty about insurance coverage um, and co-payment for reimbursement. So both reimbursement to them and then the patient having to pay for the, the medication came up as well. And um, I'll just read the personal liability uh, quote here is good. Uh, everybody's afraid of the DEA. Everybody's afraid of their own personal board of medicine issues. Everybody's scared that they're going to get a visit from the feds or get concerns with the board of medicine. Uh, we did take the time to analyze group differences. Uh, as we mentioned, there were uh, prescribers who had prescribed buprenorphine for MOUD, and there were prescribers who had not. And so when examining these themes based on these two different groupings, we, we found that among those who had not prescribed buprenorphine for MOUD, the main perceived barriers were confusion about the waiver process, uh, their experience or knowledge with buprenorphine, which is understandable to be expected, um, the resources uh, in terms of time and staff it would take, and the, the perception that uh, prescribing buprenorphine for MOUD attracts an undesirable patient population. Uh, among those who had had prescribed buprenorphine for MOUD, the main barriers mentioned were, were different. 
the, the primary barriers for those participants were a desire to refer um, to a specialist and uh, the intense follow-up that was required. But it, notably, those participants, the participants who had prescribed buprenorphine uh, for MOUD, did not mention uh, resources in terms of time or staff or reimbursement at all uh, as a barrier. So uh, to summarize, and as part of the discussion, that the this study does present rich findings on the barriers to buprenorphine prescribing uh, for, for OUD among healthcare providers. Um, for many healthcare providers, eliminating the waiver process is effective, but uh, the other barriers exist. Um, and it, removing the 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 at waiver process alone um, may not be sufficient to to remove all those barriers. So um, the the interesting part here to, to us, uh, among other things, but was the differences in the reported barriers between groups, the prescribers and the non-prescribers. And these differences really may indicate that certain barriers are maybe more perceived barriers than actual experienced barriers. So specifically things like resources. Uh, reimbursement, the uh, idea of an undesirable patient population, those may be barriers that uh, people who have not prescribed buprenorphine for MOUD are, as, a, as an MOUD, are, are, are presuming exist, where those who are prescribing it are not identifying those uh, as, as barriers. Uh, so again, acknowledging my my wonderful colleagues at, at Cedar Ocom with ROC, uh, uh, Paula and Jill, uh, please feel free to follow up with any questions uh, after the panel or during, uh, and that's all I have. Great, thanks so much, Dr. Walker. And next we have a uh, Dr. Massaro, who is a supervisory medical officer overseeing the neonatology and rare pediatric disease team in FDA's office. Pediatric Therapeutics. Go ahead, Dr. Massaro. Great, thank you. Hope you can see my screen. Yep, everything looks good. Great. I know we're running a bit behind, so I'll just jump in in the interest of time. But thank you for having me. And we're going to shift gears a little bit, um, you know, and, and speak about uh, the op opioid epidemic um, from this from the perspective of neonates and how it's affecting um, this population. So um, our, my standard disclosure. Um, so I'll say in this short amount of time that I have, I'm going to um, talk about a very complex and ever-changing and evolving space. So um, my goals today are really just to provide an uh, overview, define some terms for um, for folks, and then really um, focus on some of the regulatory um, challenges and, and what we're doing um, within FDA and, and more broadly in HHS to, um, to support and advance this area. Um, so we've heard from other speakers and um, you've seen many different versions of this curve um, and folks tuning into this session, I think understand that there's a growing uh, opioid use disorder um, and opioid epidemic in the US. Oops. And, um, and as I said, that you've um, heard from other speakers and seen these similar curves of, of rising rates that continue to rise even today. Um, so in relation to that broader opioid epidemic, um, we know that women are actually disproportionately affected by, the, um, by this. Um, they're more likely to have chronic pain or be prescribed pain relievers and um, use some of these drugs for longer periods of time and become um, potentially more um, easily dependent on these medications compared to men. This also um, is a uh, true and, and especially true for women um, between the ages of 25 and, and 54, um, which, which happens to encompass, um, you know, the ages of child, um, childbearing age. So that gives you a little bit of context for why um, the, the neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome um, is in, in particular an area of concern um, in, in the context of the over, overall um, rise in the opioid epidemic. So in the bottom graphs here, you can see that maternal opioid related diagnoses are increasing. Um, and on the, on the right side here, you can see um, 
that um, in, in, across many states in the U.S., um, some of these are increasing at, at alarming rates. So for neonates, um, we similar, again, a curve similar to the overall opioid use um, epidemic. We see the cases or uh, reported cases of neonatal opioid um, withdrawal syndrome increasing um, over time, just in parallel to that, that overall trend that we're, we're observing. So what are we talking about here? Uh, neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome, um, also sometimes termed neonatal abstinence syndrome, when we uh, think about these symptoms um, in relation to other illicit sub substances besides opioids, but is an expected and treatable outcome of prolonged opioid use um, during pregnancy where the fetus is, uh, is exposed to um, maternally medically authorized or illicit drug use. The intrauterine exposure results in physical dependence of the fetus, and then when the baby is born, the termination of that exposure um, results in withdrawal in the neonate. And these symptoms, some of these symptoms mimic what the withdrawal syndrome looks like in adults, but some of these symptoms are, are really um, specific to what we see in, in newborns, such as um, a characteristic high-pitched cry and, uh, and behaviors, feeding problems, and things that are, that are really specific to the, to the neonate. And while we know that obviously the infant needs to be exposed um, and um, there is some connection with the level of exposure and the, the rates of um, neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome, it's very uh, multifactorial and, and uh, there's a lot of different factors that go into which infants will um, exhibit withdrawal syndromes, um, symptoms and how severe those symptoms will be are not only correlated to the um, type of exposure or, or amount of um, exposure the um, neonate has in utero, but other factors as well, genetics and, and other factors uh, that come into play. So it's a very complex issue. So the current standard of care is that we monitor um, neonates that we know have been exposed and are at risk. And of course, sometimes we know and sometimes we don't, but um, the, if we do have that history, they're, they're monitored closely and observed for those symptoms that I mentioned um, of, of neonatal um, withdrawal syndrome. Um, and the, again, ever-changing landscape that we have um, several scoring tools that have been used. The most commonly used tool historically was the, the Finnegan neonatal abstinence um, scoring tool, um, which has been gone through some modifications or, or and more recently as a kind of simpler approach with um, what referred to as Eat Sleep Console or ESC um, has been um, increasingly investigated and, and um and, and used um, more widely as, as that that system um, becomes um, uh, has more studies and, and evidence supporting. Um, so once the, those whatever approach um, uh, may be used to assess um, withdrawal symptoms, then the treatment is based on on you know the severity of those symptoms or, or what's observed, and that treatment can include both non pharmacological um, interventions such as rooming in, skin to skin care, swaddling, comfort breastfeeding, um, and then of course when those um, those interventions. Um, fail to control symptoms, then pharmacologic treatment with opioid replacement therapies um, is um, the standard approach. Um, it's important to realize that there are no FDA approved treatments for neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome, um, which is why this is a, is a very challenging area um, for us because obviously we're using um, similar uh, drugs or, or, or interventions that are used in adult populations. These, this is a screenshot um, of the tools that I mentioned, the Finnegan or FNAST uh, scoring tool, and then the Eat, Sleep, and Console. So as I mentioned, it's a very complex area in, in why we are having so many challenges in developing medical products um, for treatment of, of NALS, and that includes, as I mentioned, the um, 
variability in exposure and how that exposure connects to um, incidence and severity of NOWS, um, variability across um, NICUs and um, in birth centers and how infants are being monitored and treatment and, and treated. Um, uh, when when we are worried about nows, um, there's a lot of um, ingrained um, practice, and even though there's variability across um, sites, there's um, practice that makes conducting trials in this space and conducting trials in the neonatal space in general inherently challenging. And um, design and of these trials, including what endpoints are important, um, is it reduction of the behaviors that we see? Is it um, reduction of um, you know exposure to rescue medications? Is it improvement in long-term outcomes, or is it all of those things that we're interested in? Um, are are kind of open questions and and things that are um, are hot areas of, of discussion. And then of course, um, as uh, other um, speakers have discussed some of the legal, social, ethical um, considerations in this in this space, um, not just in the neonatal area, but in general. Um, so a lot of these um, topics were discussed in uh, a workshop that occurred a couple of years ago and has a, a great report and proceedings on some of the um, thinking and in, in, and, and approaches in some of these areas, but it, as I mentioned, it's it's still a evolving um, and and challenging challenging space. So a few regulatory considerations um, we've heard. Um, you know, I, I hope I've defined what now is, is and and how it relates to the broader opioid use uh, disorder and that. Um, that um, that diagnosis is is a distinct diagnosis from what we see in neonates and and what we think about when we talk about nows, but of course other indications um, from the from the regulatory perspective and in, in drug development in these areas opioid taper acute opioid withdrawal syndrome all of these things are, are different. Um, uh, distinct um, conditions. And um, the, the question is how closely related NOWS is to opioid, acute opioid withdrawal syndrome in adults, because um, that has you know, regulatory implications. There is one product um, that has um, that is labeled for opioid withdrawal syndrome in adults that has a PREA or Pediatric Research Equity Act post-marketing requirement because um, it was labeled um, for that indication as a as a new product which um, comes with a, a regulatory requirement to study it in pediatrics um, and that is lefexity in which um, you know is, a, is an area that's being studied but again um, not yet. Um, something that's um, that, that's been approved or or completed or in, completely investigated for for this um, population. So we really don't have any um, approvals or phase three programs essentially that have um, gotten. Uh, you know, that can serve as a precedent or, or a paradigm for, for programs in this space um, with, you know, a, a study design that has um, been successful and, and resulted in an approved product. Um, part of that, as I mentioned before, are that um, the outcomes um, are still in question. There has been some work to kind of get multi-stakeholders together to decide, including perspective of families and, and providers on what outcomes are important in this space. And uh, as we get to the point where we have uh, phase three programs coming through, hopefully um, we have some advancements and tools um, in, in how we think about this space and how we um, get products available to treat this, um, this problem. But we have continued to have um, the scientific gaps as I mentioned, some of these um, understanding that the endpoints that are important, understanding all the different factors that go into um, the incidence and severity, um, and um, still a lot of um, open and unanswered questions. So. Um, there's a HHS-wide initiative called the HEAL initiative, as many folks are familiar with, um, that is uh, spearheading the, the scientific research to address some of these um, 
open-ended and scientific gaps. Um, obviously, we're a partner in this, and there's an aspect of the HEAL initiative that's really specific to um, advancing uh, our understanding of neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome and, and trying to answer some of these gaps. And again, in the interest of time, I'll just direct you to some of these links that you can read more about these programs. Um, there's several other ongoing trials um, that are really in early phase. Um, so again, I, I list these here as, as reference, um, but in the interest of time, won't go through, uh, but know that it's a very active area um, that, that um, has reason for optimism since there's a lot of interest in, in activity in this area. So we know that in summary that NOWS is increasing in conjunction with the broader opioid epidemic, that um, it, you know, we, we know how to define NOWS and identify it. Um, there are a lot of challenges in, um, in this area from a lot of different uh, aspects and, and perspectives, um, but there is some progress um, in ongoing HHS scientific um, um, interest in, in things that, that I think hold some optimism in this space. So apologize for going quickly, but I know in the interest of time, um, I will um, stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Massaro. Uh, thank you. So much to all the present presentations and speakers and for everyone listening and their interest in this work. Uh, the presentations provide an overview of the variety of efforts and perspectives and approaches to the substance use uh, problem that we're all uh, facing. It looks like we have just about one minute uh, for questions. Um, so it doesn't look like we, it looks like we have one question there, uh, which which was asking if the slides will be posted on the FDA website and the recording of the entire uh, session will be posted on the FDA Science Forum webpage. Um, if there is any other residual questions, I'm not seeing any come in, so I think we can just end it now. Um, so thank you so much to everyone that attended and all the speakers, and uh, please have a good afternoon.